Okay, Lindsay, are we ready to get started? Yes, I think we are. The live stream's up. We're ready to go. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Over to right. you. All right, I think we're ready to get started. So my name is Benita, and I'm from the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, and I'm going to be chairing the first session for this particular event. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome you all um, to this event. And I think on having this event on International Women's Day, um, it's quite a celebration, not just in terms of the speakers that we will be hearing today, but also in celebration of ourselves, um, especially the women audience um, that we hope to be able to achieve in terms of having and hosting this particular event. This is the first type of event of its sort under the DARA Big Data project. And just to give a little bit of background to this event, it stems from a report that was published about one year ago. It's the Women in Data Science report. And that report was published by Soraya. And um, I know we've shared this report with a number of you. And one of the recommendations from that report was for the hosting of more women in tech, women in science sort of events, events that showcase role models for women in STEM. And um, uh, through that particular report, we thought what better occasion to host this kind of event than through a woman in data science, specifically focusing on African women in data science event. Um, with that said, I also want to just welcome, we, we have ladies from all different professions joining us today from across Africa. We have some students, we have women in the more mid type of professions, um, we have senior level women joining us today. And I just want to say welcome to everyone. Um, and I hope that today's event, um, you would find that insightful. We are joined by a number of um, good speakers today. And I just want to say thank you to all the speakers that will be joining us. With that said, um, I think I would want to first go on to our official welcome for the Women in Data Science event. And I'm going to welcome Dr. Amelia Marutli, who is the Newton Fund in Country Manager for South Africa to say a few words for this event. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so good morning, uh, distinguished guests on the panel, uh, Director of Bilateral Relations at the Department of Science and Innovation. Gentlemen, and a special good morning to all women in the audience on this significant occasion that marks International Women's Day. In honor of all women around the globe, especially the trailblazing and aspiring young African women in science. The development for Africa through radio astronomy, DARA Big Data Program, offers training in radio astronomy, data sciences and entrepreneurship, and is one of the flagship programs under the UK South African Newton Fund Partnership. I'm very proud of all the achievements of all partners involved, as well as the many participants who have benefited from postgraduate training and who are now leading the way into the future, equipped with critical and innovative STEM skills that the continent and the world needs in this time of transformation and adoption of the fourth industrial revolution. Promotion of gender equality is a key feature of all our Newton programs and is at the heart of shaping a better and shared future for all. As uh, Dr. Deswart mentioned, last year around this time, the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory released their uh, Women in Data Science report that highlighted what further measures could be implemented to support young African women in data sciences through the Dara Big Data Program and other future initiatives. A key finding from the report was the lack of visible, visible African female role models who are working in frontier areas of data science and who could play a significant and active role in inspiring a young cohort of female data scientists and innovators. The report also identified the need for a woman in data science event that could showcase and profile Africa's female talent in emerging technologies around areas within data science as an excellent initiative to inspire and engage a younger generation of female students from across the continent. I am pleased therefore that one year on, this is finally happening. This African Women in Data Science event is held for the very first time in response to the recommendations in the report. 
On behalf of the UK South African Newton Fund, I would like to thank the organizers that have put together a very exciting program. I hope you all enjoyed today and find great inspiration listening to these remarkable women as they share and reflect on how they are forging new paths and avenues for the young women of today and the future. I would just like to end with this rally call to all young African women out there. Please be bold and courageous. Seek and take each opportunity to learn, hone your skills and share with your fellow female companions and your future and that of the continent will always be bright. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amelia. Um, I just want to let the audience know if you have any comments or questions, please post it to the Q&A um, within the webinar. Um, that can be to any of our speakers today. Um, then we're going to be moving on to Kaya Sishuba, who is a rep representative from the South African Department of Science and Innovation. And he is the Director for Bilateral Relations for Europe and the Gulf States. Kaya. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Good morning, everyone. I would like uh, to welcome you all on behalf of the Department of Science and Innovation. And of course, on my own behalf, I'm, I'm very much proud to be part of this important occasion. Uh, I have been requested to, to join this DARA webinar and to make remarks on this rich partnership and collaboration connect, connectedness with the UK and other regional uh, partners. It is my pleasure to do that. First of all, a happy International Day to all women researchers. Uh, and if we were having this uh, 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 workshop uh, personally, I'll be distributing uh, chocolates to all the, the ladies there. But uh, this workshop is uh, indeed taking place in a very challenging time of COVID-19 and such uh, we can't meet physical. Nevertheless, we are not uh, defeated here. We meet our great virtual means. Our lives must continue in the advancement of our societies. After all, science must pave the way out of this challenge. COVID-19 though has uh, taught us an important international, that in, uh, international cooperation is very important and how critical it is to, to tackle global challenges together. Cooperation, coordination and partnership will ever remain necessary and vital in the future advancement of mankind. After all, science knows no borders, and that, ex that expression finds meaning and is well illustrated in the data partnership activities across national borders. As the DSI, we, we've been following closely the data partnership activities since the inception of the Newton Partnership and with UK and other role players within the region through their wide ranging science activities. We can say without equivocation that this is one of the impactful collaboration within, the, within the, region, the region, delivering to our science diplomacy, and most importantly, to our strategic policy strategies aimed at developing human capital engaging research, and also impacting in, in our strengthening of innovation capacities within the national system of innovation. Similarly, the department is particularly pleased with the impact of DARA cooperation activities and its impact on women in research, a, a human capital development, innovation, and the variety of activities well documented in this regard. I may just mention, as uh, 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 Dr. Marutla has indicated, the, the female participation in the DARA Big Data Program, scholarship awards, adv advanced data science training. This is really significant to, to us as a DSI, not only for our bilateral relations, but for advancement of the frontiers of science and global partnership that makes difference in the lives of the society. This partnership is to us a blueprint for what the DSI seeks to achieve, thus taking down the border barriers for scientific partnership as illustrated by the partnership uh, between uh, the regional countries as well as the as, um, UK in general. Allow me to conclude by, by, by acknowledging the UK High Commission for being a very reliable partner in this uh, cooperation under the flagship banner of the Newton Fund. And Dr. Barutle has been the pillar of this partnership. And we thank you, Madam, for your role in this uh, uh, the, the partnership. Our special thanks uh, goes to Dr. Bonita Swart for her stewardship and passion, I must add, in steering this program so successfully and, 
and it is very in, in a very impactful way as well. Without your endless energy and dedication, we would not have achieved this much. Lastly, to the participants, uh, we wish you all a very successful webinar. I certainly believe that the contacts and networks that are formed here and the exchange of knowledge and uh, know-how will shape long-term partnerships and relations amongst uh, the participating countries as well as uh, the participants themselves. May this partnership continue long to the future. And I thank you all. Thank you very much for that, Kaya. And um, I just want to say that we appreciate all the support that we've been receiving from the DSI and from the Newton Fund. And um, also, I know with Amelia, just being able to call on you <laughs> when, when we are um, in need and when we do need advice, I think that's played uh, quite a remarkable role in forming both Dara and Dara Big Data um, from the South African side. So thank you very that's much to you to and you. Amelia. <laughs> thank you. Okay, with um, the official welcome um, coming close to an end, we have one more speech, and that is by Ms. Portlako Makua, who is currently a data engineering manage manager at Accenture South Africa. And Portlako is a young data scientist, and we thought what better way um, to start off this event than by hearing what the views and vision are from a young data scientist and a young professional and what they would like to see um, achieved through these kinds of events and how to promote women in science and frontier role in Africa. And with this, I would like to welcome Putlako. Um, are you able to yes. hear us, join us? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I think this is a wonderful initiative and I hope it's the first of many. Um, and I think I want to say happy International Women's Day. And even to all the men that are on this call, you also matter, you also should be celebrated and, you know, happy Humans Day <laughs> just in general. Um, I'd like to start off by going through some statistics, right? So when you look at the top tech, uh, global tech companies in the world, about 19% of you know, science and technology-based positions in those companies are women, uh, you know, are, 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 are women positions. And then when you look more into leadership and management roles in these sort of areas, it's only about 28% of women occupying these spaces. And then when you take it down to education level, right? When you look at um, on average, only 19% of young females graduate with STEM related, um, you know, um, qualifications. And this on its own speaks to the, a, a very high level of misrepresentation of women holistically, both in the education uh, space and also in the workforce. And it's, it's understandable why and things are improving, but I think, you know, more can be done. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're here today, why these kind of, you know, um, conversations are had and events are, are held. So before I started sharing my vision, I felt it's important for us to understand where we are now before we could even start speaking about where the future lies. Now, when it comes to, you know, ways in which we can ensure that women, um, are more visible within the STEM, you know, space. I think uh, there's so many things that, you know, that could be done, that could be fixed, that could be improved. But for me, the three things that stood out for me is, is awareness. And the second thing is innovation. And the third thing is mentorship. Now, speaking about awareness, I think we need to increase awareness on you know, what STEM is, what data science is specifically, especially given that it's not a very old you know, um, career path. A lot of, if you go to high schools now and you ask a lot of you know, learners, what, what is data science? Most of them don't know. I speak personally for myself. I only knew what data science was when I was probably 20 years old. So by then it was also a sort of more, a more of, I couldn't even take a, a, a degree in that, because I had already started on something else. So we need to create awareness around this. And this could be done through 
creating more initiatives and you know creating more funding opportunities as well so that learners who are moving from their higher education into universities know about the opportunities know what science science you know stem careers are and i think this is key and i think if we increase the amount of graduates that come out of universities and stem essentially that's going to increase the workforce supply of these kinds of skills for females and then when speaking about mentorship i think when it comes to mentorship um, it's important for women who find themselves in leadership positions, who find themselves in positions of influence, to also take it upon themselves, right, to uplift young people who come before them by mentoring them, by extending opportunities, and by also promoting growth to young graduates, to young professionals. So that's the third, that's the second key thing. And the last thing which I think is important is I'd like to see more women being in the forefront of innovation. You know, I'd like to see the, in future, the biggest tech science research companies being led, being owned, and being ran by women, you know, I think it's empowering and it's going to help change the status quo. And it's also going to help with the current imbalance in terms of representation. And one of the ways this can be done is platforms need to be created where, you know, groundbreaking ideas by women for women for other human beings are being encouraged, are being supported, are being invested in and are being funded because I don't think there isn't many you know, um, incentives for women who have groundbreaking ideas. Right now, you might be sitting on a, an amazing, amazing, you know, AI solution for data science that could change the world as a woman. But where do you go? Who do you speak to? Where do you get the resources, the funding, the support? So we need to hone these kind of things. And I think this organ uh, this event, the first of many, it's, it's these kind of events where we can talk more about these things, where we can, you know, action more of these things and I, i'm glad it's happening and i hope it's the first of many and i hope it's not only going to be something that happens on women's day you know we need to recognize this and make sure it's something that constantly is applied in our daily lives and i'm, I'm just going to close with that um thank you very much everybody so yeah thank you very much potlako so um, potlako will be part of the panel um session we will hear more about from her and the rest of the panel. And I think that we will be hearing some more about these particular points um, through the panel discussion. But thank you very much, Potlaka, for that. Um, we appreciate your ideas and thoughts. And I think it's the right way to start off this particular event. Thanks, Bonita. All right. Okay. Um, so we're going to move ahead now with our keynote presentation. Um, Kathleen, are you there? I'm just checking. So um, we've got a very inspirational speaker today, Kathleen Semenyu, uh, who is currently a machine learning fellow with the Mozilla Foundation. And Kathleen focuses on natural language processing for African languages. And I know that she's doing a lot of, of interesting and innovative type of work um, with Mozilla currently. And I've placed Kathleen under a very general type of theme, which is the inclusion of African languages in new types of technologies. And I think that is very important um, as we move into what is typically known or transition into this fourth industrial revolution. Um, and with that said, I'm going to leave it to Kathleen. Hi, <laughs> can you hear me? I can, yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Bonita, and it's truly a pleasure to be speaking to this gathering today. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kathleen Tsuminyu, and the title of my presentation is Building Language Tools on Common Voice Using Kiswahili as a Case Study, and I shall just kick it off. So um, as Bonita has introduced already, uh, my current title professionally is Machine Learning Fellow at the Mozilla Foundation, where I'm specifically focused on building for Kiswahili on the Common Voice project. And this is what I will speak about in much more detail during the presentation. So for now, I'll leave it at that. And then beyond that, broadly, I wear two hats. Um, and then under these two hats, I have held and continue to hold um, several roles. So the first is community organizer. I've been organizing tech communities for as long as I've been working in tech. Um, I started out co-organizing the Nairobi Women in Machine Learning and Data Science community for a couple of years. 
this this was and continues to be a platform by which women can explore these fields and showcase work that they have done. I am a member of the Deep Learning Indaba Committee, and the Indaba is an initiative to strengthen African machine learning. And we have several programs in support of this mission. The main one being an annual event that brings together the African AI community. I worked as regional coordinator of AI4D, so that's artificial intelligence for development, where my role involved co-creating programs by which we could allocate grant funding to African researchers working at the intersection of AI and society. Um, I'm also a member of the Masakane Committee. So Masakane is an organization working to strengthen African NLP. And I have more recently connected with some wonderful women with whom we're in the progress of setting up a Women in Voice Africa chapter. We actually got registered, I think it was two weeks ago. So that's um, very exciting. And then the second hat I wear is that of NLP researcher. And in my work, I focused on African languages. Uh, my journey started in machine translation, where as part of Masakane, I worked on models for several Kenyan languages. And I'm now more focused on work in speech recognition. And um, this started with some work in phoneme recognition for Luya languages, and now speech recognition for Kiswahili. So my presentation today is grouped in several sections. First, I will do an introduction of the Common Voice project and then talk about the Kiswahili community building that we have been doing. Um, I'll then go into discussing gender challenges in technology and then finally, uh, multidisciplinary collaboration that we have done to, I'll say, improve the success of our project. So starting with the introduction. Um, what is Common Voice? Uh, launched in June of 2017, Mozilla's project Common Voice wants to build open and publicly available data sets of labeled audio that anyone can use to train voice enabled applications. So it's part of Mozilla's efforts to help teach machines how real people speak. It's a bet we're making about the future of human machine interaction. It's a project aimed at making voice recognition open and accessible to everyone. So Common Voice is about collecting voice data in a safe and ethical way that can be used to train speech recognition algorithms. In this part of the work, I'll speak particularly about um, building a Kiswahili speech recognition dataset on Common Voice. But before we get to the Kiswahili part, um, I'll say my favorite thing about this project is the fact that it makes it super simple to start building speech recognition resources for the languages that you care about. So you don't have to worry about starting to build a data collection platform because that is essentially what Common Voice provides. You don't have to worry about where the data is stored or how it will be stored. Common Voice also abstracts these and you essentially get to leverage the engineering and storage capacity that Mozilla Foundation is putting towards the project. There's comprehensive documentation on how you can get started. So if your language does not currently exist, you will need to begin with localizing the website, then move on to collecting a text corpus. And this slide has useful content um, linked to the documentation that can be leveraged in the early stages of getting a language onto Common Voice. Um, and I'll be sure to share it with the organizers so that everybody can have access to it in case uh, this is of interest to you. Then once the site is localized and you've seeded the platform with some sentences, you'll be able to start on the voice corpus. So this is um, what the platform looks like when it comes to contributing to the voice corpus either by recording clips and donating your voice or validating clips that have already been recorded. Then on to the Kiswahili community building. So with respect to Kiswahili, the Mozilla Foundation embarked upon a three-year funded project with a focus on building out language data corpora in East Africa with a focus on Kiswahili. So this funding is generally supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, NGIZ. And this co-work is aimed at building skills and capabilities within the Mozilla Foundation and within the region 
to democratize voice technology through community engagement and contribution. And it will also support use case development within agriculture and finance. For Kiswahili, um, we actually have part of the data that's already available if you go into the Common Voice website um, and check on the languages. So in the latest release, we now have 655 hours of data. Our target is to get this data set to between 1,000 and 2,000 hours of data in the coming year. And being cognizant of the fact that voice systems have been biased for have been biased with poor performance on women as well as older populations, we're working to ensure that these demographics that are likely to be underrepresented in the in the corpus are intentionally included, particularly at the point of data collection. Um, if you look at this at the screenshot I've included, you can already see. Uh, which details the latest available Kiswahili dataset has. Um, it indicates that older people are already the minority and that there's also a disparity between men and women. And these are dynamics that we are working to counter. And I'll speak more about um, the gender challenges ahead. Uh, communities at the core of the Common Voice Project and Mozilla Foundation at large. And a large component, again, of our work focuses on community building efforts. A community member is an individual who falls in one or more um, of the definitions form, on the, of the definitions shown. So you could be a voice donor um, by way of contributing your voice on the platform. You could be a sentence creator um, by creating sentences, which we then later use to collect voice data could be a voice validator by going onto the platform, listening to audios that have already been recorded and validating those. Um, or you could be a voice data set user um, by actually downloading the data set and building either speech recognition um, applications, models, or whatever other use case you may have for this. And in addition to these, um, in our work, we have found great success in engaging with individuals known as community champions. So these are individuals in the community that have already shown interest in the language and growing a more diverse data set with regards to use in um, technologies. So we worked to identify champions within the countries speaking the Kiswahili language. So far, we have uh, representatives from Kenya, Tanzania, and the DRC. There are a wide variety of events that community champions can host. These are centered around growing a community around the Kiswahili language and also towards thinking about more inclusive technology for this voice use, for voice use cases. Um, we emphasize that content coming out of these activities will be made available to the public through an open license. As the entire data set is CC0. So even at the point of um, crowdsourcing sentences, we have to be very careful not to take anything that may be um, IP or copyrighted and owned by someone, um, which has presented a bit of a challenge, but we found that actually hosting events where people sit down to intentionally write, so a write a has been something that has been um, very successful in our work. And so these events can be a mix of virtual and physical sessions. Um, and we've also found great success with pre-recording videos which can then be played at physical events if necessary. Uh, in this third section, I will go into the challenges in the gender challenges in voice technology. So central to our work is the inclusion of women and there are a variety of reasons why women are underrepresented in voice technology. Um, I will highlight some. Um, there are less female data sets or perhaps less female representation in voice data sets. So we find that majority of programs are geared towards profit generation and are often created to cater for specific markets and often created to using male white voices. So it's, it's, def it's difficult to find sex disaggregation of data sets to at least indicate the extent of participation for purposes of gender analysis. And in addition, even when designed to be open and inclusive, there is a challenge of female voice contributions. For example, English voice donations show 
male voice data sets, male voice data sets dominate at 47%, while female, uh, while women fall behind at only 15%. With lack of representation of female voice data sets to train the models, it's therefore difficult to find the patterns within data that are representative of the female population, leading to biases in algorithms created. And then something else that's, that we have found to be major is, is trust. There's trust issues around privacy and data protection also impact how women interact with voice technologies. Um, we find that there are concerns raised around increased surveillance, bias, and discrimination, as well as data governance that shape and that shape the levels of trust for women and gender diverse people. So UNESCO recommends that AI should address issues of consent and confirmation of ethical use of data, privacy, and security for women and girls. And the Web Foundation in their research found that 54% of female respondents said they would not allow companies to use any of their data compared to 47% of men. Um, again, which just goes to show that where making your data or personal information publicly accessible is concerned, women do have more reservations and with good reasons because there are a lot of trust issues which we need to think about and consider. So gender is diverse, it is heterogeneous, it is tied to societal constructs about roles, expectations, and practices that would impact and shape participation of gender groups, and in particular women, differently from men. Um, we are working to build a diverse and inclusive voice community that is ac accessible to all taking into account these issues, together with other structural issues impacting gender inequality such as location, sexual orientation, education, region, and accent. Um, the two areas we choose to focus on, agriculture and finance, heavily impact women. Majority of farmers in local communities are women, and leaving them out will be leaving out exactly the uh, people we aim to help. So how are we making sure we are inclusive? Um, we have a gender action plan that guides how we foster inclusion across the gender spectrum. Um, the gender plan takes into account the challenges that hinder inclusion, what measures and actions we can take to address them, and also how we can track through indicators and targets if we are attaining proper gender parity. Uh, this work is led by my colleague, Rebecca Riakitimbo. And then there are a, a number of other things which we are undertaking as well. So curating a gender balance in community building and um, engagement. We're addressing gender concerns through our participatory guidelines and making sure that women do feel safe in these spaces that we are putting or creating. Um, aggregating and labeling of data by gender to ensure that it can be disaggregated by gender. And then um, we're taking a participatory approach from ideation, data collection, use case development, model creation, all the way to application. And all this just to mean we're not, we're not stopping at the point of wanting women to contribute their voices onto the data sets. We would also love to create uh, platforms and spaces for them to be part of creating solutions and even be the people who are creating solutions given the the voice data set and the resources created from this work so nothing for us without us and then moving into the final section of this work um, multidisciplinary collaboration with linguists and language experts um, we have worked with this group of this group of people um, and you may be asking yourself, why do we need linguists? Um, I'm smiling because of, as a techie, I, I feel like we, we over, overstate the importance of technology and then are very much at risk of not including people from other disciplines when we are building this technology. So to the question of why we need linguists, I will answer to make voice technology sound like us. Um, Again, as I've already mentioned, speech recognition systems have been found to be biased or to fall short in scenarios where the source data is not balanced. And balance implies having equal quantities of data available in different categories represented in the data. So 
research has shown that speech recognition is more accurate for men than women and also for individuals younger than 30 years of age than those older or 30 years old. Than those older than 30 years old. Um, beyond age and gender, some other characteristics of data sets that present that may present bias in downstream applications, if not balanced, are accents, dialects, and variations of languages. So to avoid a situation where an application developed for one locale performs considerably worse in another locale, only a couple of hundred kilometers away, we actually need language experts to help us identify what these nuanced differences are and to help us ensure we are intentional about their representation in the overall Kiswahili data set in this case. What we know today as standardized Kiswahili has a controversial history and it may actually surprise you to learn that among the Swahili people, there is a great level of disassociation or dissociation from the standardized version of the language. Um, this is because locals were not consulted or involved in the process of selecting what dialect to standardize. So what we know today as Kiswahili originated from a dialect known as Kiunguja, and there are 23 known Kiswahili dialects, 13 of which are more widely used than the others. And when it came to the decision about which dialect should be standardized, this decision was made exclusively by missionaries. It came down to a debate between the different missionary groups arguing in favor of the dialects that were spoken in the locales in which they were stationed. It was based on what the missionaries were most familiar with and had little to do with the people themselves or in fact the languages. Then with the decision to standardize Kiunguja came the realization that it was not linguistically rich enough and needed supplementary vocabulary. And once again, at this stage, the Swahili people were not involved, which resulted in a growing distance between Kiunguja, the dialect selected for standardization, and the Kiswahili, which emerged after the process of standardization. Then with the standard Kiswahili came efforts to drive its propagation by ensuring it is the language taught and used in schools. This gave rise to linguistic insecurity and the continued massacre of dialects related to Kiswahili. Linguistic insecurity is the negative, the negative self-image of a speaker regarding his or her own speech variety or language. It might happen if the speaker compares his or her phonetic and syntactic characteristics of speech with those characteristics of what is perceived to be correct. And I put correct in quotes. And unfortunately, this is what the native Swahili people are subjected to in school and other formal settings where they interact with those of us who learn and use standard Kiswahili. They are repeatedly corrected, made to believe what they speak at home is incorrect. But of course, the truth is much more complex than that. Unfortunately, uh, the result is that there naturally occurs a drift towards that which we are made to believe is correct and away from the diversity present among the native Swahili people. There are presently Kiswahili dialects on the brink of extinction and others progressively falling away from use literally every day. So how did these learnings from the linguist engagement impact our work? Well, from linguists and language experts, we learn that building in isolation as technologists, as developers, and as NLP researchers is not the right thing to do. We learn that even if our main intention is to build a Kiswahili dataset on Common Voice and to make it publicly available so that it can benefit Kiswahili speaking populations, this will not inherently happen if we do not take the time to understand aspects of the history and of the language and the Kiswahili people. The history of the language and the Kiswahili people. We learn that if we proceed without conscious consideration, we risk alienating some of the populations that this resource should actually benefit. Our time with the linguists involves working to identify the dominant dialects and variants of Kiswahili that are most widely used presently 
We then worked with them and had them do field work, which served to, which served to develop texts that are reflective of the variants and dialects identified as prevalent. And by prevalent, um, I mean, has a large number of speakers or is likely to have a great, uh, greater impact if resources are developed. And of course, in comparison to the work that is being done for the wider Kiswahili data set, which is based on standard Kiswahili, these subsets will be significantly smaller, but our intention is to have the texts and the audios collected from the respective communities be subsets of the whole. And these subsets will have two main purposes. The first is to help us quantitatively evaluate how our models and downstream applications perform on related dialects and variants. We would like to work towards models with equal performance across various variant and dialect speakers, not forgetting the gender and age aspects as well, of course. And a first step will be figuring out if there, if there is indeed degraded performance for the different demographic groups. And the second is in the event that the performance is degraded for different demographics, we would like to make resources available to developers so that depending on the particular local context that they are building applications for, they will be able to fine tune so as to improve performance if necessary, given the resources created and made available. So that brings me to the end of this presentation. Um, thank you for listening. We encourage you to share our mission with your social networks using the hashtag um, common voice. And I would be happy to connect on Twitter using the my handle at Siminu underscore cats. Thank you again. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, may I just remind um, individuals that you can post your questions in the Q&A in the webinar um, if you have any questions to the speakers. Um, Kathleen, we do have a question, and um, this is from Jane Toms Mondi, who wants to know what do they need to do to be part of your projects? Um, he or she goes on to say, I would like to get a chance to apply the skills I've learned so far and gain hands on experience. And um, just judging by the question before, this person has a diploma or studying for a diploma in artificial intelligence. My first degree is in BSc in biology. Um, so they would like to know what steps can they take um, to either be part of this particular project or how do they get more involved with data science in general? Uh, okay, so I'd ask them if they're a Kiswahili speaker because then it's very easy for me to say, reach out to me and I'll look for one of the available roles in our community activities and see how you can be beneficial in that sense. But even if you're not a community speaker, um, I would encourage you to check out Common Voice and see if the languages or any languages that you speak or would be interested in, in contributing to or building for are already available on Common Voice. Um, if yes, then it's as easy as deciding whether you want to download the available data set and such training models or um, contributing your voice or validating or creating sentences to add to the data set. Um, if your language is not already on Common Voice, um, again, I'd say reach out to me. I can connect you to individuals on the wider Common Voice team who deal specifically with building or helping language communities to start. Um, and we've also got loads of documentation in terms of getting started. So again, I'll share this presentation with Bonita and I hope it manages to get to everyone. But then there's useful links there which take you literally from my language is not on common voice. How do I get it there to finally having voice contributions and one day potentially having a data set that people can download and use to train um, speech recognition models. All right, okay, thank you. Okay, then there's another question by Laon Chiole, and um, I'm going to try, it's a bit of a long question, but I'll try to <laughs> summarize it. Is there an option automatic language detect detection based on speech once the data has been collected and the models trained? Um, EPS, how do we ensure there isn't confusion when it comes to correctly detecting languages? And the reason this person is asking is because there are certain phrases in different languages which are the same but mean different things. 
So, um, Kathleen, are you able to understand and answer that question? <laughs> I can. I can try. So, uh, language detection and speech recognition are two very different tasks. Ideally, if you're doing speech recognition, you know what languages, what language you're building for. So, if it's Kiswahili, then the expectation is that you'll be giving your model or your application Kiswahili speech, which you then expect text to come out of. If it is Zulu, then you'll be giving your model or application Zulu speech and expect some Zulu text to be coming out of that. In terms of language identification, again, it's a completely different task because identifying whether a language is Kiswahili or Zulu, that's a completely different model. The data set looks different. Um, and unfortunately, I cannot speak to it. I will say that uh, a, a challenge that we face building in speech recognition, particularly in Africa, is the fact that our societies are very multilingual. And so code switching is likely to happen. Um, so there are techniques to deal with code switching in speech recognition, and perhaps that may help in your context where the society is very multilingual and it's possible for someone to come onto your application and be speaking a instead of B or a mixture of the two. So it may be useful looking into code switching methods for um, speech recognition. Um, yeah, beyond that, I, I hope this response has been helpful in some way. Thank okay. you. Um, there's another question. Um, what kinds of technology products are imagined to come from these voice technologies? Okay, that's a good question. So I've, I've mentioned briefly in the presentation that we are in this phase of the work focusing on getting applications in agriculture and in finance. Um, and this is a decision that is very much driven by the networks that our funders currently have on the continent. So in terms of farmers, we realize that there's a lot of knowledge held within these communities. And also there's a lot of knowledge available on the internet, but then language may be a barrier, both to these farming communities getting their knowledge on the internet, as well as to them getting access to information that's already on the internet to help with their farming activities. So um, I will say that we've, we've recently put out a grant call because building of these applications is not something that we as Mozilla are going to do. We've been working on building relationship with partners who work in farming and in finance so that they can receive grant funding and potentially build applications that they already use in their work, as opposed to us building end use applications that, you know, are just nice and fancy, but then nobody actually needs or ever uses. Um, but then in our research, popular um, use cases that we've seen, particularly in farming, is like an information kiosk, where um, it's something that's centrally located, where let's say in a marketplace where farmers frequent potentially to come bring their produce. And so it's an information kiosk in that you can go to it, access it, talk to it via speech. If your plant potentially has some symptoms which may signal a disease, you can talk about them with the information kiosk um, and get some response or some suggestions on what you may be able to do. Alternatively, um, if you already have some ideas or have done some things, that's also something you can speak with speak about with the information kiosk and then the data or that information gets recorded. So it's two way in that way. Um, we've also seen several suggestions or um, recommendations for applications in a call center setting. So it may again be in the context of farmers and them calling in to speak about um, plant or animal diseases. It may also be in the context of um, finance. So in Kenya in particular, we have a lot of chamas, which are, um, I would say, table banking groups. So uh, women running stores at a market may come together and say, hey, let's be putting aside money every week or every two weeks with a certain goal in mind. And having a call center functionality would potentially automate the process of checking if everybody has made their monthly contribution, or double checking who needs to be receiving the money this month for their own purposes. Um, I will again say all oh, these are hypothetical use cases, but then the idea will be for the end user to build the application that they use and we'll be working to support that process in whatever way we can. All right, thank you.
for that answer. And that was the question from Siri. And I think Siri added an additional question on how can ordinary Africans access these technologies? And I think Kathleen, you've hinted to that, that already. Um, so I think that we, we, we won't answer that question since you already have hinted to that question. Um, I'm just looking if there are any other questions for you, Kathleen. Um, I think that um, many people are saying that they are um, thanking you for your interesting presentation um, and giving them some more insight on what the applications of data science are. Um, there's an anonymous question, I think. Um, it says, so if there are more female voice data sets, so what is the follow-up? What is the benefit? Um, and this is a person, so they cannot relate to the impact of it. Okay. Well, again, I'm, I'm going to use very Western examples, but we see that a lot of um, voice-enabled applications are now becoming the key to access to information, um, for example, voice assistants. And the impact of them not being, um, not having good performance of, on women is that you have to struggle or change your voice, potentially deepen your voice so that you can be understood. and let me liken this to the example of um, of face recognition, which is much more popular with uh, face recognition, or is it face recognition? Yeah, face recognition being much more, uh, much better performing on men than on women. And then there's different levels, right? So there's black men, black women, and all sorts of shades. It's it's the same thing for speech recognition. If for as long as the data sets are mainly white and male dominated, and that's the demographic that is going to get ideal performance. That's essentially who these tools are being built for. So it means for everything that we automate and we say voice recognition or um, speech recognition is needed to access that, then it means then that the white male demographic is getting the best out of it and the rest of us have to struggle. Uh, to use another example, I um, some time ago read about an article of on the use of um, voice assistants, particularly in Nigeria. So I know that Google now has uh, um, a Nigerian accent, for example, on maps. And it's because they realized that if you're Nigerian, you could be you know, having a conversation with your buddies in a social setting. And then if you needed to speak to your voice assistant to get some sort of information, you need to completely change your accent and sound American for you to be understood and for you to get what information you need. So this sort of adaptation of us needing to change our diversity, whether it is cultural diversity or whether it is gender diversity, so as to be understood on digital spaces, which are increasingly becoming very important in our daily lives, it's, it's just not fair. Um, and I'll say to sum it up, that we're simply evening the playing ground for men and for women. Everybody should get as good performance um, on whatever technology is in use and get access to whatever platforms these technologies are giving us access to. Okay. Thank you, Kathleen. I think we have time for one more question and it's Jane Thomas again, asking you, um, are you able to translate languages, for instance, um, the input may be in English and expect an output in Swahili, or is it purely Swahili? Mm. So our work is purely in Swahili. Um, yeah, our work is purely in Swahili. Speech translation is again a completely different task whose um, data set even is built also quite differently from the speech recognition data set. But then um, I will say I'm optimistic that the work that we're doing for Chiswahili now could potentially in future uh, make it easier for us to venture into speech translation. Thank you. Um, there are many questions about opportunities, um, people looking at opportunities within the area of data science and research opportunities. And um, I just want to recommend to anyone on the panel, if, if you are aware of any opportunities, um, if you could just post that as well um, to the Q&A so that everyone is aware of the, what kind of opportunities are out there as well as mentorship opportunities. And we'll try to address this during the day. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, I think that the work that you're doing is it's quite remarkable. 
And I'm so happy that you could have joined us this morning. And I know that you're also one of those very busy people. <laughs> um, and there, there seems to be a lot of interest in your work, especially from um, people with coming from the different African countries. Um, it's not, I've seen, seen some comments from um, an individual from Zimbabwe interested in your work, as well as many South Africans for many African language, South African languages that could be included into these types of technologies. So again, thank you very much for your time for being part of today's event. It's been my absolute pleasure and I wish you all happy participation in the rest of today's agenda. Thank you very much. And we will try to share Kathleen's um, presentation. Um, I know there have been requests for sharing that presentation. Right, we are going to move on. Um, and the next session is going to be our panel discussion. And that is gonna be led and chaired by Associate Professor Carolina Ottman Govender. And I'm going to leave it to Carolina to chair this particular session. Um, Caroline, are you ready to take over? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Bonita. And uh, wow, what a way to start the day. Um, what inspiration uh, we, we have already. <clears throat> this, is, this is really, truly fantastic. So, so thank you for for brilliant uh, keynote address, Kathleen. Um, and I am now I've got the, the incredible privilege to be able to present to you our panel of six incredible women who are going to tell us about their experiences and their visions for the future and so on about women in data science. Um, and uh, so we will have. We will first go around uh, the table to hear what they each have to say. Then we'll have a, an interactive discussion, Q&A style. And then uh, when it's time to wrap up, we'll go around the table again um, to ask them to for last, uh, last words. So <clears throat> I see everyone is coming online now. If our speakers could please um, switch on their cameras um, and their microphones. And it will be my absolute pleasure to first introduce them. So they've sent us um, their, their bios and uh, prepare to be amazed because all of these women are fantastic. So I'm going to start with Dr. Guguleto Mabuza Hoke. Right, um, so um, Dr. Guguleto holds a PhD degree in electrical and electronic engineering from the University of Johannesburg. Um, she's currently employed at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the CSIR, um, and there she is a research group leader for the surveillance and countermeasure systems. So it's part of the, the defense and security cluster. So really, she's, she's keeping us safe here. Um, uh, she holds an MTech degree in telecommunications, <coughs> cum laude. Um, an um, MSc degree in electronic systems on, and then a PhD. Uh, she's also a supervisor and a mentor for members in her research group and for the students involved in masters and PhD degrees. Her academic work in the field of science and, and technology has won her numerous awards, including the Tata South African Women in Science Awards in 2011. Uh, she was first runner up with the Science Communication Competition FameLab in South Africa in 2014. And if you know FameLab, you know that really means that she is a fantastic communicator. Um, and she's a brand ambassador of the Ideas That Work campaign for the CSIR. That's uh, Dr. Gubileto. If you could just wave to our audience. Yay, fantastic, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to introduce everyone and then, and then we'll, we'll pass, you, pass you the mic. Then we have Dr. Araba Say. So Dr. Araba Say is a principal research scientist at the University of Washington. And she's got projects all over the place. So she's working at the Information School and the Ocean Nexus Center. And that's a center that works to transform ocean governance so that the oceans benefit everyone equitably and in a culturally relevant manner. So this is super interesting. She's also a senior research fellow with Research ICT Africa, which is a dis digital policy regulation and governance think tank. And then her research specifically examines digital and social inequalities. So she helped to establish the research coalition of the Equals Global Partnership for Gender Digital Equality. And so this is a global partnership working to bridge um, the gender uh, digital divide. And she uses her research to explore ways to foster diversity, social equity, 
and knowledge democracy in digital development and in policy making processes. So really at the heart of making sure uh, digital technologies are accessible and equitable for women and, um, and people around the world. Then we have Dr. Shriz Dan. Oh, sorry, Dr. Arapa, say, can you please wave to the audience? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, now Dr. Shriz Dan. Um, so Dr. Shriz is a co-founder and chief operating officer of South Africa Makes. So we have an entrepreneur here in the room. And it's an award-winning medical device digital manufacturing company. She holds a PhD in medical biochemistry from the University of Cape Town. Um, she specializes in cancer research. And uh, South Africa Makes, the company that she's co-founded, has been featured on TEDx and in the Mail and Guardian. And it's one of Fast Companies, uh, Fast Company South Africa's most innovative companies from 2021. Um, she has facilitated partnerships with Form Labs, uh, being their first African ambassador, and also Autodesk to develop new healthcare and medical innovations on the continent. Um, and currently South Africa makes is developing an affordable and sustainable healthcare innovation in Africa, including in vitro diagnostic and um, uh, medical devices for COVID-19. So at the heart of the fight against the pandemic. Thank you for that. Um, in 2021, Dr. Dunn was selected as one of Westgrove's young innovators in the Western Cape health tech sector. Um, she is one of the 50 most inspiring women um, in STEM in South Africa. Um, she's also um, earned the Mailing Guardian Top 200 Young South Africans for business and entrepreneurship. And she has mentored more than 500 youth and female entrepreneurs in design thinking principles and critical digital tools to be used by under-resourced startups as part of the Youth in Business and Top Tech Tools for Women in Business programs launched by the Cape Innovation and Technology Initiative. So really um, lots of mentorship and entrepreneurship here uh, with a background in science. So fantastic to have you here. Suriz, maybe you can wave to the audience. There we go, fantastic. Uh, next, we have Dr. Kegonia Awori. So Dr. Kegonia Awori, hello. <laughs> is an applied scientist at Microsoft Africa Research Institute. Um, she has over 10 years of experience in user experience research and design, and she's worked across the globe in countries like Kenya, the UK, Australia, um, in companies such as the iHub Kenya, one of the early innovation hubs in, uh, in the whole continent, incredible innovat innovators, iHub, and Microsoft Research, and the National Australian Bank, and Safaricom, which is also a place that helped innovate and, and bring things like M-Pesa into the market and things like that. So that's fantastic. Um, Kegonia also leads the research on the future of work in Africa and her work. She holds a dual master's in human-computer interaction from Carnegie Mellon University in the US and a bachelor's in business information technology from Strathmore University in Kenya and her PhD in computer engineering from the University of Melbourne, Australia. So a true world citizen here. She's also passionate about creating knowledge on and for people and businesses in Africa and building AI solutions for them that can be scaled globally. In her free time, she enjoys traveling, swimming, hiking, but also mentoring young women. And for that, we're really grateful. Egonia, if you could please wave to the audience. Thank you, thank you. And next we have Anelda van der Waalt. Um, Anelda has, a, has formal education and research experience in bioinformatics and in next generation gene sequencing. In 2014, she established a South African training and consulting company called Telarify. Telarify is committed to working with research organizations, groups and individuals to help build human capacity in reproducible research, open science, and computational and digital research across all disciplines. And this is really the future research. Research now, uh, there is much more demand for reproducible research, for digital assets being citable and re retrievable and open science with fair use principles of data and so on. So she's really at the heart of the action here. Um, over the years, Anelda has gained extensive experience with human capacity development in transdisciplinary spaces 
and specifically in multicultural and multilingual contexts, which is really interesting. She's also been heavily involved in supporting communities of practice run computational and digital resources across Africa. Inelda also has a passion for mentorship and is involved in various South African and international mentorship programs, such as Escalator, Open Life Design, The Carpentries, um, the Software Sustainability Fellowship. And to clarify, her company's flagship projects currently include Escalator, which is funded and co-led by Savilar, which is a, um, a South African project at the heart of, of languages, an, an amazing initiative, and AfriMapper, which is funded through the Wellcome Trust. So welcome, Nelda, if you could please wave to the audience. Thank you so much. And um, the last member of this, not, not the least, of course, of this illustrious panel, um, you've heard from her before, it's Potlako Makrua. A quick profile on Patlua, uh, Potlako, sorry. Potlako is a young South African professional who is proficient in many areas. She's trained to be an astrophysicist. She works as a data scientist by day and as a budding business mogul by night. <laughs> I love this profile. But Lacko obtained her undergraduate degree in astrophysics and applied mathematics from the University of the Witwatersrand. And during this time, she worked as a student intern also at the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. <clears throat> Sorry, so a colleague of Benita. <clears throat> gaining exposure to data science through the Square Kilometer Array Telescope. Um, she then moved into the corporate sector, working with analytics, data engineering, and telecommunications. She currently works as a technology manager for the Microsoft Group at Accenture, and her client scope ranges from providing solutions architecture for cloud computing capabilities to developing data science-driven solutions to enhance product and service offerings. So, um, Potlaki, if you could just wave to the audience, please. Thank you so much. So this is the fantastic panel of women that we have here today covering anything from academic science to entrepreneurship, to corporate world, to innovation, lots of mentorship and inclusion and diversity um, in, in the digital world. And so with this fantastic panel, I would like to please first all invite each one of you to give your views on the role African women can play in the fourth industrial revolution through various technologies based on, the on your specific area and your specific experience. You have five to six minutes each. Google it, why don't you start please? All right, uh, thank you Carolina for the opportunity and uh, a warm uh, greetings to everyone. It is really a pleasure to be here today. So um, in response to your question, maybe let me, let me start with uh, a little story. I remember I was once invited to the DSI to address young female students, grade A, grade 10 to 12, more or less. And I was asking them, why are you interested in science? And many of them said, because I want a good job, because I want a good pay. And I could understand why they were saying that at the time. But then when I delved deeper, in asking them, but do you understand why we need maths or why we need science in general? Uh, the answer was like, oh, we, we, we really don't know. We just don't care. We just want good jobs. And at some point, I got to a point where I was explaining to them about the fundamentals of maths and science in general, how that can help you solve any problem that you come across in life be it in want to innovate something, be it in technology. And with that discussion, I, I asked them, you guys know about X plus three is equals to five. They say, yeah, we do. And I asked them, but what is X? And they told me X is a variable. Okay, but what does that mean? They couldn't tell me. And then I, I took them back to grade one, grade two mathematics. And I said to him, to them, you remember when we were taught that there's a square plus three is equal to five. They say, yeah. And I say, okay, fill in the square. And they say, it's two. And I'm like, but how did you come to that uh, realization? And number one, number two, that box is actually X. It's just that when we grow older, we can't be writing boxes and circles and triangles 
to represent an unknown. So that box, when you see X, just think box. When you see Y, just think circle. When you see triangle, just think, you know, something must go in there. And then with that description, they actually learned that. They're like, oh my God, we've been doing X and Y and we didn't know what it even means. And I say, exactly. That box that you learned about in grade one, grade two mathematics is the same X that you're seeing today. And you may as well get used to it because that's how the world will evolve. All right. So, and then uh, the other one, one of the, the, the students there was asking me, but what is science? And I, 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 to explain that, I had to show them that science operates in a way that the human mind works, which is if there are two people, I put one person in another room and I put another person in another room and I say to them, to the one person in the other room, okay, tell me what you're seeing. And that is observation. And that reason, that, 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 this definition that I'm going to give to you is the one that resonates in my work life on how we define science and how it actually works in my day-to-day -day living and how it all leads to the fourth industrial revolution. All right, so tell me what you're seeing. That is the definition of science, observation, all right? Can you identify for me exactly what it is that you're seeing in your current environment or in that room, in that space where you would be, all right? So that is identification. So science is defined as the observation, what we see. After you see, you identify. And I say, okay, give me a description of exactly what you're identifying. So that is the other part, I, uh, description. And then after description, I say, all right, Let's do experimental um, investigations to confirm if what you, are, what you are observing, what you are identifying, what you are describing is actually the picture that I have in my mind being in the other room. And then based on those observations, based on those identif identifications, based on those descriptions, then we can compare the results of the experiment and everything that you have done to make now the theoretical explanation. So we observe everything that we see, we observe, we identify, we describe, we need to validate it by making experiments. And in the, in the, in the case of the fourth industrial revolution and where I work is that without that, those exercises being done, I will not be able to validate my results. Now, this is the defense and uh, security space. In the defense and security space, what we do with my research group, we want to see. We see through optics. Optics is lenses. Optics is cameras. Anything that can see, which is the observation, which is exactly how the human behaves, that we take that information and we want to see if what we observed is truly what is. And in the midst of all this, we then are able to come up with the experimental um, investigations to validate our, our observations vis-a-vis -vis the, the experiments that we would have done. So um, in a nutshell, the fourth industrial revolution and where we are today, unfortunately, my personal views are we're still suffering from the lack of electricity. We're still suffering from access to the internet. And those two things are what drive the fourth industrial revolution. Without electricity, there is no internet. Without internet, things are not connected. And without that, our country or our continent as a whole will always be catching up to what is being done. So those are my, are my, are my challenges as we speak. And I realize that I may not have all the power, but I can contribute bit by bit in the work that I do to make sure that we get there. Thank you. Thank you for those inspiring words. Um, and, and thank you for the, the, the mentoring of, of grade 10 to 12 students. It is, it is so important. Um, yes, now I would like to hand over the mic to Dr. Arabase, please.
Great. So um, what are your thoughts? Please go ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, um, I, I think I, I may approach this a little differently. And I want to start by saying, I since there are many different types of Africans, I hesitate to ascribe any roles to African women as a whole. But having said that, there are numerous ways that women can, in general, can participate in their fourth industrial revolution. And the most obvious one is one which we hear a lot about these days and which I think even Kathleen sort of referred to in her, in her presentation, in her keynote presentation. And that is to contribute to the design and the creation of fourth industrial revolution technologies. And we know that globally, there's a severe lack of women not to mention African women um, in the design of these technologies which are driving social and economic life. And the result is that these technologies are mostly designed from a male and non-African perspective. So having women participate or be involved in creating those technologies um, would ideally lead to some technologies that reflect um, our um, values and needs and interests as well. Um, however, there, there are a host of other roles, technical and non-technical, that women can play. And I'm going to mention just three of them um, very briefly, financing, governing, and analyzing. So first in financing, there's a lot of evidence that the vast majority of financial capital goes to male-led male uh, institutions or entrepreneurs. And a lot of the, the venture capital, especially in the world today, is going to digital uh, enterprises. So in essence, fourth industrial revolution uh, startups. Um, and so this makes it difficult for female entrepreneurs in, in particular to get essential startup funding and black or African female entrepreneurs even more so. Um, but there's also some evidence that women financiers are more likely to invest in ventures that are founded or led or co-led by women. So African women who work in banking or in venture capital can help to channel funding towards women-led, women-founded or women-co-founded uh, enterprises or to what we call gender lens investing generally. Governing. Um, trends in digital technology have already established that technologies tend to reproduce or worsen social inequalities and in some cases even directly cause harm to specific groups. So we need governance systems that are able to shape the creation of these technologies and guard against harmful use. And currently these systems are being discussed and developed with limited representation of, uh, of African voices. And so again here, African women I think can play a role by obtaining the type of training that's needed to participate in policymaking and management of uh, new technological systems. The challenge here is that it's often difficult to find people who have the technical skills to understand the industry and the technology, as well as sort of the, the legal or management um, or governance knowledge to uh, participate in those policy making decisions as well. So as you think about careers in, in data science, I think you could also think about uh, getting some of those uh, management and governance skills so that you can uh, participate meaningfully in, in those conversations and bring in an, an African perspective. Um, third is to analyze, and as a researcher interested in the social significance of information and communication technologies, I fall into this, this category. I'm a social scientist. And by studying the role of technology in society, social science research can uncover gender trends that may be invisible or hidden or not taken seriously such as the extent of gender pay gaps, uh, skewed data sets, um, as Kathleen mentioned, that lead to biased uh, decision-making or designs that embody male values only. You can also anticipate future trends such as potential benefits, but especially potential negative or unintended consequences. So in short, in addition to contributing to creating the technology, 
women can also contribute to providing the resources that go into creating the technology, shaping the organizational environment in which the technology is created, or shaping the social environment in which the technology is used. And ideally doing these in ways that distributes the benefits and the burdens of technology more evenly across different populations. I'm done. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've taken a lot of notes there. That's such an interesting uh, perspective. And I'm sure we will definitely touch on several of those points in our, in our upcoming um, discussion. This is fantastic. Um, and next, uh, Dr. Cherise Dunn, if you could please um, take the mic and, and share your thoughts with us. Yes, of course. Thank you, Carolina, for the introduction. Um, for this particular question, I think I'm going to briefly share my insights from an advocacy and an entrepreneurial point of view, so something slightly different. Um, and thinking about this question, I was considering the different challenges that we experience here on the continent and thinking that African women can really bring, you know, our unique experiences when approaching these challenges. So I think that women in general can make a significant contribution towards long-term value from the 4IR by forming part of the critical conversations and implementations and the reskilling of the current workforce. So as women, you know, we can bring a level of empathy and some deeper understanding of the community needs to the different projects that we work on. And I'll give you an example. So currently as the only ambassador on the African continent, which is ridiculous for an international 3D printing hardware and software um, um, and materials company, I provide feedback on my environment and the needs of our healthcare startups that we engage with and we collaborate with here in Southern Africa. Um, that, for example, use additive manufacturing to create their prototypes for their solutions um, affecting heart valves and heart disease. So by sharing my insight with local startups about what can be achieved with the technology and helping them with their gaps in the knowledge and working with Formlabs, who's a much bigger global player, we've helped them to develop these better, um, better 3D printing materials that in some ways are better suited for our local patient needs. Um, which is great for us and for obviously for, um, for the African community, but it really does benefit the rest of the world too and Formlabs as a company. So there's real collaboration that has mutual benefit here. So that's what I think, having women participate in the design of 4 our solutions in general just allows our solutions to be, to be much more inclusive. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much uh, for that input. I think your experience is really quite unique. And uh, yeah, thank you for being the ambassador um, for the entire continent of Africa. And I hope uh, many other women will join your ranks soon. <laughs> um, our uh, next um, speaker for some input, please. I would like to welcome Dr. Kagonia um, Awori, please. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina. Um, thank you for the audience. We're really happy to um, be part of this panel and to have this very great conversation. So the question is, why should women take part in the fourth industrial revolution? Why should women like you or women who you support take part in it? My first simple answer is because we have before. So in the previous um, industrial revolutions, if you think about the first, second and the third, um, where we're, we're transitioning from use of coal and then you know, the use of gas, and then use of electricity, women played very significant roles. The only difference is that at that time, we never got much of the, of the appreciation or the, or the airtime or the publicity. I mean, think of say um, the first, um, I believe she was the first um, engineer to make central heating more con uh, commercially sustainable. It was uh, an African-American uh, African woman um, in the 90, early 1990s. 19, like early 1900s, but we've never heard of her, right? Um, if I remember well, her name is Alice Parker. And, you know, at that time, women would make great strides in innovation, great strides in technology, but less their attention. We live in a completely different world. We live now in the world of, you know, in, in the informational, where data is gold, where information is gold, where the internet has made things much more ubiquitous. So why should we take part? Because historically, we've, we've always been taking part. In fact, even the first computer programmer is, um, is a woman. Um, look her up, at Ada uh, Lovelace. So this really inspires us to know that our role is central in the progression of how humans continue to evolve and will continue to evolve. So that's number one. 
The second thing is, and related to the first point, it has been much more difficult for women to take part in um, changing the world, in, you know, in contributing to technology, in contributing to knowledge, in contributing to advancements in science or STEM, even STEAM, right? Um, because the because these crafts have been a bit more, sorry to use the word, a bit more male, male dominated. I mean, I can't imagine myself trying to contribute like to stuff like the electricity or the coal industry, but I'm very comfortable in computer engineering and computer science. It's where I've found I'm passionate and where I'm driven. And I know I can make change um, not only to the world, but especially to Africa, the continent I love. So this type of uh, um, evolution is making it very, very easy for women or rather easier for women to have a central role. When we think about some of the things in the four IRs, we're talking about AI, we're talking about computing, quantum computing, you know, um, internet of things, the vast majority of it. Um, we are centrally placed to, to have a conversation like this one, and even to take part in roles that are no longer gender, gender specific. You know, as Alia had said, if we take part like in coal, in the coal um, revolution, it feels male-like. Right. I know these rules are not gendered, but society has gendered them. But right now, come to engineering and IT, while it was before, now we're moving away from that. We're moving away from it looking like a masculine role or a muscular, muscular task. Now we're opening the playfield. Honestly, we're in 2023. There's no longer the, the question of whether we can do it. We definitely can. So let's move on away from that, really. And then and lastly, um, my field is human computer interaction. And um, it's a computer engineering field. So it's the combination of design, social sciences, and um, computer, like the, the technical part is the computer science part. So by design, I mean, you know, when we look at user interface design, user experience design, essentially, how do you craft machinery? How do you craft technology to work in the way that it should? Then now from the social sciences, we borrow a lot from anthropology, sociology, um, a lot of the, the, the humanities really help us here because we want to understand how people work, how people form organizations, how people use um, tools so that we can build better tools for them. And lastly, of course, now we have this bit here, right? So the engineering bit. So we have the programming, the programmers, um, the data scientists, the AI engineers. So combining that in the central, we have HCI, which really is about designing technology that people use and how to better make their lives. So HCI directly contributes to fields like AI and machine learning and IoT, yet it's not necessarily regarded as a, um, a strictly um, technical skill, but it's very important. It's a design skill that you can use to better shape technology. Why do I point this out? There are very many other um, skills in computer science and computer engineering that may be more favorable, right? To, um, to people, and, and, I, and I dare not say only women, to people who find that they want to contribute to 4IR through skill sets that are not only about programming and coding, right? So you can still contribute to making better algorithms, ethical design, right? Inclusive algorithms are something that's becoming much more sustainable. We need, we can contribute to these conversations and contribute to this craft by, by being experts in other fields. So my last point is gonna be on, on how we create and make algorithms. So how, how are we going to ensure that our algorithms will not um, pop up, you know, a gorilla when you put in black woman? How are we going to ensure that you're going to try and wash your hands and you put your hand under the, the tap because your, your hand is uh, dark colored, it does not detect you, right? Such fields, right? It's very much related to AI, but thinking about how do we code, right? It's called explainable AI. So how do you ensure that the AI is explainable? We need a diversity of roles. And because as women, we're used to being very diverse and very inclusive, we are very necessary and central to 4IR. Because if you don't involve everyone in the conversation, if you don't involve everyone in the making, of the technology we're going to use tomorrow, then we're going to create really evil <laughs> and terrible technologies. So those are the, my three ma major points. And just remember, we've always been central in every single revolution. Why stop now? Secondly, for IR, now we can take part in many more that are less quote unquote masculine. And lastly, the diversity of, of, of what for IR entails, even when it comes to AI, the diversity of roles we can take up, give us no excuse but to jump onto that bandwagon. Thank you very much, Caroline, and my other panelists. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was a fascinating uh, contribution. Thank you so much. 
Um, next I, on the list I have here is um, Anelda van der Wout. And Hi, good luck, we're you. coming to you after that. Thank you. And everyone, thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to join you here today. Um, my work here is almost done. I was expecting um, much more focus on the computational side of things. And I thought I was going to be the one to canvas for humanities and social sciences, um, the importance of humanities and social sciences in data science conversations. Um, but thank you so much to my fellow pan panelists and the um, keynote speaker who's already done a great job of explaining why humanities and social sciences are necessary in the data science conversations as well. I'm briefly going to explain, um, introduce my own background, share some of the work that I've been involved in, um, and then explain why it's critical to expand our view of data science beyond computation and systems and look at that impact on humanities. <clears throat> so my own undergraduate degree was in genetics, biochemistry and psychology, and my honors actually focused on population genetics of plankton. Um, I enrolled for the second intake of the first master's degree in bioinformatics in the country. So that was right, right at the stage when computational um, skills were coming to the life sciences in a more formalized manner. Um, we were only five students in that group um, and most of us had a background in life sciences. So very limited uh, pr prior exposure to computational skills. Over the next few years, I learned data science skills as they apply to life sciences, but this was before data science was coined as a field, really. Um, so we, we didn't talk about data science skills. We talked about algorithms and all the nitty gritty. Um, I specifically learned about these skills in a genomics and proteomics application. Although the field was heavily male dominated at that stage, I was really lucky to have a few women in my class and also as senior mentors and role models. I became involved in human capacity development very, very early on in my career, even as a master's student. And we also saw, always saw loads of life scientists coming through our workshops to learn fundamentals and more advanced skills to enable new research and empower them to perform their own data analysis. Not uncommon to what we're seeing today in other disciplines as well. We also saw computer scientists coming through to learn about biology, to inform design and development of algorithms and tools and unfortunately, this is not so common in um, the design of algorithms and, and technologies these days. You don't often see collaborations between the computational sciences and the, uh, the humanities and social sciences, or not uh, at least from the design phase of projects. Sometimes you see that later on only. In 2014, I moved away from bioinformatics and became more involved in transdisciplinary work, which I really enjoy. Um, and data science capacity development initiatives now include a training for researchers from across the research landscape, including life scientists, health researchers, engineers, and more. In 2015, I started a company and expanded the audience even more. So we started working now with librarians, IT staff, research support staff, psychologists, and educators. As we moved away from working with traditionally more computational fields, the number of women participating in our events increased. So let's pause here to note, there are so many women outside of the computational sciences who could contribute hugely to the field of data science if they were included in the conversations and training. Um, I also quickly want to look at the term data science or in the uh, context of this conversation here today for IR. This means a lot of things to different people. Um, there's a continuum of skills and tools that are needed to function as a data scientist. And there's also a plethora of people who make up the workforce of data scientists. Many people immediately think of analysts, mathematical geniuses, programming wizards, or engineers when data science is mentioned. But there's so much more, as we've heard already from the panel and from the keynote speaker about um, ethics, legal aspects, digital storytelling and media, data management, including archivists and librarians, anthropology, psychology, and sociology to understand the impact on or behavior of women, uh, humans in the increasingly digital world. Um, although most data science programs in the past exclusively focused on participants from computational backgrounds, more and more people are realizing the value that people with, that scholars with applied um, knowledge brings to the workplace. Um, including, I saw there was a question from someone in the audience who is asking, I've got a background in economics and econometrics. Can I move into data science? Yes, please do. People with applied knowledge 
can really bring a different perspective to questions and problems. Um, so more recently, we've seen calls and co for co papers and conferences that include scholars from humanities and social sciences, but the wording are often still very um, inaccessible to people from outside of the computational sciences. So if we pause here, maybe we need to carefully evaluate the landscape of data science and be honest about the skills that are needed to allow data science to support the creation of a better world. Computational knowledge and experience are not sufficient and we can't any longer pretend that that's all you need. And how can we help to bring other disciplines to the table? Just very quickly in South Africa, um, there are two programs that are specifically focusing on bringing humanities and social sciences um, closer to the, or well, to the table of data science conversations. The one is the National eScience Postgraduate Teaching and Training Platform, NetTTP, launched in 2017 and they run um, an MA, a master's program specifically for uh, humanities and social sciences researchers uh, who wants to learn data science. And they, um, it's an 18-month program where they do some research and they learn programming in R and all kinds of things. So specifically for people with um, with a master's uh, with um, background in in arts and and social sciences. We also launched the Escalator program, and that is to help grow a community humanities and social sciences are along the, uh, with data science skills. Um, and this is a very, very big program and includes a wide variety of activities and, and tracks. Um, but in 2021, we launched a, a mentorship track specifically for women because we know that when we start talking about computational and digital skills, we lose women. Um, and this, this track attracted 30 women from 15 institutions and we are uh, launching a second iteration um, next week and hoping to attract more women there. Um, so my, audi my message to the audience is we need your skills, experience and viewpoints regardless of your background. Without it, we can't use data science to make this world a better place for everyone. If you have strong computational skills, there's so many opportunities to get involved and help teach and empower others from primary school coding clubs to youth employment initiatives, libraries, volunteering, and of course the Escalator program so you can get in touch if you're interested to share your skills. If you're new to the field of data science, don't be afraid to ask. Partner with someone, find a mentor, a study buddy, much easier to learn together. Let us as African women be at the forefront of making data science inclusive and relevant to our communities in a responsible manner. Thank you. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very informative. Um, and again, I think it highlights this point that um, anybody can contribute to the 4 IR and one doesn't need to be shaped through um, engineering and science and mathematics degrees. So this is really a very inclusive discussion already. So I'm really thrilled to hear that. Um, and uh, our uh, uh, last panelist to still give um, input into this discussion is Potlako Makua. If you could please um, take it away and give us your thoughts. Okay, thanks, Carolina. Um, I think, like Anelda said, well, I mean, the ladies covered everything in and out. So um, I think I, I don't want to repeat certain points. So I think that the only last thing I want to talk about, and I think I'm going to approach it more from also a humanitarian uh, point of view is um, now that you know the skills of data science are being addressed now that awareness is somehow being you know addressed and created and women are being motivated to take on careers in this field I think one way that we can impact you know the fourth industrial revolution is to now start focusing also on with these skills that we're working so hard to to get you know with us trying so much to be part of, you know, this field that, you know, used to be male dominated, right? Now that we are here, we have an opportunity, we have an equal voice. What can we do as women to change the world, right? Using the skills we have, using the fourth industrial revolution, what can we do to change the world? There are so many challenges. And I think as women, we understand our challenges better. No one can understand, you know, certain things that a woman goes through or a girl child goes through more than them, because it's, it's something that we go through. And I think 
it's now important for us to look at the challenges we face. And these are challenges that have been existing for many, many years, right? And back then there was no data science, right? And when, and there was no, you know, com cloud computing, there was no, you know, tech, there was no digital space. That's why some of those issues could not be addressed. And then as time went by, when those were introduced, again, they were introduced, but it was male dominated. So women didn't necessarily have a voice in, in all of that, right? So we couldn't necessarily impact. So now that we're in that position, my, my, my key thing is, how can we, what can we then do to change the world using this? And I, and I have a few things that I thought of, right? When you look at the challenges that we face as women and not even just as women, as Africans or South Africans or wherever one may be, when you look at gender-based violence, it's something that has happened so many times. So many women succumb to gender-based you know, violence. As we speak, there's a young girl, there's a woman somewhere being raped or something happening to them. It's happened for so long. And you know, we've, we've given this to governments, to men to try to help, help us find a solution but none of those have been very useful or to the extent that they should be. And as women, we understand the extent of this. Now, the question we need to ask ourselves is, how do we use in fourth industrial revolution? How do we use data science? How do we use AI to sort of alleviate this or bridge this gap? And when you think of gender-based violence, one of the things I thought of, which is an application to fourth industrial revolution is, imagine if there was, was an application, right? a chatbot application accessible to every woman, whether you have a smartphone or not, it could be SMS based, right? Or USSD based where there's no charge. Imagine if there was a chatbot available to every woman where if you are in, in an emergency situation, whether you, it's, it's violence or something or crime, where you could literally just click a button depending on what situation you're, based, you're dealing with, where you could click a button and it signals something to a cloud platform somewhere that pings your immediate location. And it, based on the button you click, let's say yellow stands for um, sexual violation, or you can sense that someone, you know, kidnap. You click a yellow button. This yellow button goes to a cloud platform somewhere. This cloud platform uses machine learning and AI to, to say if a yellow button has been clicked, we can track using the, this person's MSISDN, right? We can track their location and it hints that something is about to happen to this young girl, to this woman. And you didn't have to do much, you know, that's data science, that's AI, that's cloud computing. And that's us using it to solve or to rather help make the issues of gender-based violence better. Imagine if something like that could be built using AI robotics and it, it could literally help change the world, you know? And, and that's one of the things. And another thing that I also thought of is when you think about electricity, someone mentioned something about electricity. I've been thinking about this electricity issue quite a lot. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, sometimes when load shedding happens, you only know one day before, and this is from a South African perspective, my apologies. Um, you, sometimes it just switches off now. When you look at power plants, they have efficiencies, they have maintenance. Can't there be some AI functionalities that are built which check the efficiency of a power plant? And then to see if the power plant's efficiency is sitting at, let's say the optimal is 80%. If it drops to 70%, can't it signal something somewhere? And then that is used to address the fact that we're having a power point, a power efficiency deficit at this specific power point and it's going to affect that and that that's using ai and using that we could literally be put in a position where because when you look at electricity it affects businesses where businesses can know even before the load shedding actually happens that there's a high chance that load shedding is going to happen right that's ai that's literally computing as well. It's things sitting in the cloud, being easily accessible to people, using machine learning and algorithms to predict things that actually impact our livelihoods as, uh, as, as human beings. Um, another thing that I also thought of is when you also look at, and this is me addressing the challenges, when you look at poverty, and when you look at poverty, and let's bring it down to how poverty affects women and young girls. How many women and young girls around the continent don't go to school because they're on their periods, because they don't have sanitation, you know, because they don't have access to that. They can't afford it. How many of them as we sitting have not been able to attend school for the past seven days because they don't have access to sanitation? Now, the question we need to ask ourselves as women who have the skills, who have the influence, 
how do we use the first industrial revolution to help bridge that gap? How do we help that young girl sitting in a village somewhere who is smart, who is bright, but they are not able to go to school because they don't have sanitation? How do you use data science and get that case? And again, it's as simple as that. Imagine implementing, and this is me trying to uh, come up with use cases to address these problems so we can see the impact it has. Imagine coming up with smart watches that are distributed, right? And this smart watch, Checks the test, test uh, the uh, what's this, uh, uh, estrogen levels of a woman. And remember, when you go to your periods, your heart rate change tracks all of that information, right? And it signals to you even before you can go to your period, maybe two weeks before to say, because sometimes you get it early to say you're about to go on your period as a young girl and you don't have, let's say you don't have access to sanitation. Imagine if. That also, you know, smartwatch would also ping locations of other women around you or young girls around you who had sanitary pads at that point in time. Maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's someone and you can click and then it signals that to an, a smartwatch of another woman to say, there's a young girl in the next street, she's going on her period, she doesn't have sanitation and you have logged that you have two and you can share. That's AI and that's literally changing the world building something like that, more girls would be able to go to school and achieve all these STEM careers that we're talking about, where else they can't do that now, because, you know, fourth industrial revolution is not necessarily catering to some of the needs that could literally change the world. And I think it's up to us as women to address those, because they affect us more than they affect other people in some instances, for instance, you know, periods, you know, you, we understand, and I'm pretty sure we are Africans in here, we have, there's lots of us who've have never had an opportunity to attend a lecture in varsity because you didn't have sanitation. But maybe your roommate had one and maybe you could have just pinged to find out if she does. And you maybe an app, an AI solution could have assisted you in that case. So I just wanted to approach it in, in, in that approach to say, fourth industrial revolution is so powerful because it could literally change the world. It could end so many injustices. It could save lives. It, it, it's so powerful just, you know, to even think about it. So yeah, that's, that's my, um, my, my take on it. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for, for sharing your passion and your, the, what, what you're literally role modeling there is, is thinking big and dreaming big and, and really demonstrating that nothing stops us from really just jumping on, on the opportunity and creating solutions. So, so thank you for that. Um, so see now for the audience, I think we've, we're, we can all appreciate the, the, the caliber of, of thinkers and doers and makers and innovators that we have here today. And so I would like to, on behalf of the audience and everyone here, really thank all of you for, for sharing your ideas already. And we've really, we've really already gained so much insight and so much inspiration from all of this. Um, I'm going to take a few questions uh, from, from the audience. I see some have been, um, some of them have been answered already. Uh, let me get to my to the Q and A. There we go. So uh, Lorinda is asking. Uh, she said, "I would like to use knowledge of Python, machine learning, etc., to be able to find solutions to problems related to the challenges of access to electricity and the internet to promote the development of my country. What steps can I take?" Um, and I see Putlako, you'd like to to answer that one. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I was so excited when I saw that because it was part of, you know, the things I spoke of. And it's something I've also been thinking about. How do we use it? And I think I covered it a little bit to say, I think um, the important one way for us to use this is access. The thing about data science, right, what makes data science so powerful is access to data. If you don't have access to data, you can't necessarily use data science to its optimal. So if we... Um, could have access to the information on power plants. For instance, look at power plants. All we know every time there's load shedding is that there's a power plant that's down. We don't know what, what's, what's down about the power plant, right? So if we could get access from ESCOM or from whoever supplies electricity, if we could get information around what a power plant is, what makes a power plant 
um, function to its optimal level. All these data points, right? And also if we could get historic data and something I've been thinking of doing, I'm glad someone spoke about it. If we could also uh, get information of historically in the past two years, this is data science in play, right? In the past two years, how many times did we have, let's look at one location, how many times did this specific location had a power uh, plant failure, right? And that's data points. And now when you dig deeper into things called features and data sciences, you'll now say on, on a failure of a power plant, what features are key in that? What affects a power plant's failure, right? Is it fuel? Is it this? Is it that? Is it heat? And then those attributes map out to you what causes that. And if we can have, and this is information that's available, it's sitting at ESCOM. It's just a matter of us asking for it and us using our skills as data scientists to map things out. And if we could do that, and if you have those data points, you can literally ingest them into a database somewhere in a cloud platform or locally, and then you ingest them into Python. And literally all you could do is to say, this power plant uh, for the past year has been behaving like this. Can we not predict any future failures of this power plant based on the previous behavior? That's you using predictive machine learning. And so that's one of the ways we could do it. Somebody asked. So I think the key answer to this is, if you know Python because this person spoke to Python, all you would need is access to data. And that's all we need. If ESCOM could literally give us, even now, let's say we're a group of, of women data scientists, someone knows R, someone knows uh, SQL, someone knows Python, and someone has a connection in ESCOM somewhere, and we get access or we build a proposal, we say, we'd like to get data of your power plants, of your schedules, of every time that power was off. We could literally use that data to build something so powerful. And that's literally all we need. Literally, the answer is data, access to data. That's how we could actually help to solve issues of electricity. And I hope I answered the question correctly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see that uh, Anilda has also answered the question. Um, maybe Anilda, you can, you can uh, give your answer also by voice. Sorry, I'm on two devices trying to have sound and, and the visuals as well. Um, thank you very much, Carolina, and thank you very much for the question. I think um, it really depends on um, what your aims are and where you're starting from. My um, typical people that I work with um, who are interested in getting involved in the data space, data science space, often start with something more manageable, um, and maybe even before reaching out to institutions and organizations to access data that they might not have workflows set up to share yet or policies for sharing data, it might be useful to look at open data um, platforms. And I've shared a few links where you can go and have a look at what is available for your country in terms of electricity supply um, and internet access. Often um, the national census have some information about, and what's nice about national census data is um, normally divided up in regions in your country um, at the different administrative levels. So it can be in South Africa, for example, at provincial level, at national level, or even down to the ward level within uh, municipalities. So you can maybe get access to who's got in access to internet, um you know what where is electricity supply through that kind of data set there's also the zindi africa platform which i've shared which is a data science competition and often they share their data sets openly even if you're not participating in the in the um actual uh competitions you still get access to the to the data sets and it, Mostly those data sets are relevant to questions that are being asked about um, things that's, uh, that's in the community, that have problems that are in the community. Um, and then if you are looking at Zindi Africa, you can also get access to other solutions that are being developed in different programming languages by the community and participants in the competition. Um, I've also shared the humanitarian data exchange where there's data sets that are shared by humanitarian um, organizations, Red Cross um, and Gift of the Givers and, and other organizations, which may be useful for questions related to electricity access. I know we were recently working on hospital data, um, looking at health facilities across Africa 
um, and the capabilities of the different health facilities. And some data sets do have information about whether those health facilities, for example, have electricity access. Uh, so, you know, so I think really it depends on what your, what your, where you are at and where you want to go to consider how you will tackle that. Is it a big research project that you have funding for? Is it a small um, uh, kind of a first venture into data science for yourself? Do you have people that you want to collaborate with? Do you want a, a coding buddy to work with you? And then um, you can work from there. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that great comprehensive answer. And, uh, that, um, I would like to just remind the audience to, who's watching the feed live on YouTube that um, you can also post questions in the YouTube chat. I'm keeping an eye on that as well. So if there are questions popping up there, um, I'll be able to... Um, uh, to, to pass them on to, to our panelists. Um, our next question comes from Tia Villun, who asks, how would you bridge the gap between getting a PhD in genetics and, bio and bioinformatics slash data science? Um, where do you go back to? Is it at MSc level or where? And this question is uh, for you, Anelda. Thank you, Tia um, and Carolina. Um, yeah, again, really, it depends on what your timeline is and what your resources are. I mean, if you if you need to um, earn money and you have a family, then I think your plan will live differently from when if you are um, young and you can sleep on your parents' couch or, you know, just dig in full time and do, you do a study course. Um, different MSCs also, I noticed um, someone else was asking... I think it was Jane Toms asked, um, how do you choose an MSc program for in bioinformatics? And that really, really depends on what your ultimate goal is. What do you want to do with those skills? Is it um, like one of the panelists said to, to earn a better salary? Or is it because you have very specific interest in, in very specific questions? That will also depend on, um, that will also inform your decision about how to get into the bioinformatics space. Um, so the things that I've seen in the past is that it often works well if you get involved in a project that have a bioinformatician working on it and you ask to work closely with them um, so that you can start to see what, it, what the work involves, maybe take on some of the smaller um, aspects of it that's uh, within, the, within your skill set and kind of start out with a mentor. Um, I would say going back to do an MSc again, really, I would only do that if I had lots of time and lots of money and didn't have a, um, the need to get into this quickly. You've got your applied knowledge. Sounds like you've got a PhD in genetics. Um, and picking up the skills can be through, again, study groups and taking online programming courses and getting involved in projects that have bioinformatics components um, and taking on small tasks um, under mentorship and guidance. Yeah, I, I have so many ways to do it. It really depends on, on what you want to achieve and where you're at. Great, um, thank you so much, um, Anelda, for that. I think you've also answered um, Jane Tom's question there because that, that question is now in, in answered. Um, I would just like to add something to your answer, if I may to Jane Thompson, who's in Kenya and would like to do bioinformatics. I would like you to, to I would like to point you to a project called um, H3A Bionet. So this is a pan-African, um, African genetics analysis, but H3A uh, project, a research project, but H3A, H3A Bionet, um, the website is h3abionet.org, have a lot of training courses that they run pan-African um, um, bioinformatics classes. Um, so I really recommend you, you look and they've, they've, they, they run them remotely, but also with local instructors. And I know there are quite a few in Kenya. So, so uh, please do take a look at that. Um, we have a question from uh, Amanda Skuzana. Uh, who says, can we also talk about lack of information about data science within universities? Uh, in my university, um, they only share much needed um, 
to data science to the STEM group, and we are only fed the end product, which is really challenging. I think this is a, a very good question. So um, who, uh, yeah, Potlako says she would like to answer this question. Please go ahead. Um, yes, I think, you know, this misinformation about data science, honestly, it's not even just in universities. Even when you get to the workforce, you'll actually begin to realize that it's highly, highly misunderstood, you know, that sometimes you look at a job post and it will say data science and you read description and it's something completely different, right? And I think even in high school level, I think the main thing about data science is it's something that needs to be Educate, education around it needs to be created, not even from a university level, because by then, some to some extent, it's, it's somehow too late, right? Imagine you went for an engineering degree or, or something that you didn't really feel passionate about because you didn't know what options you have available. And then you find out about data science on your third year, right? When you could have found out about data science in high school when you were still choosing your subjects then it at least makes it easier for young people to make informed decisions about what data science is. I think awareness around what data science is because it's, it's, it's an old but new field, if, if that makes sense. I think someone covered this to say back then it was just called algorithms, but then the name around it, AI data science, is something very recent. For instance, in my case, um, I finished my degree in 2017 um, and I only knew what data science was that year when I was doing my third year. I was doing my um, astrophysics and astronomy, and I was working with Bonita at SKA. That was the first time ever in my life I found out that there's something called data science. And to my surprise, when you look at data science and big data, it's lots of data. And I thought to myself, I've been studying in astrophysics, studying space, studying stars. That's big data. That's something I should have known. So I think awareness needs to be created around this from a very early age, high school level, even primary. If kids can know about astronauts and doctors when they're in primary, why can't they know about data scientists, right? And I think because it's such a new field, it's also our responsibility now, as the people who are aware about this, people who can actually influence it. It's our responsibility to come up with initiatives, because no, no one is going to do it, do it for us, to come up with initiatives that create awareness around this. Go to the high school that you used to, you know, learn in when back in your days, if you know about data science, you know, create a day where you can just call all the matriculants to explain to them what data science is. Give them, you know, use cases of how it's used in the world. You know, yeah, a lot of young people aspire to work for companies like your Google, your Apple, and they don't understand that these companies are powered by AI, are powered by data science. If they understood that, they'd understand what data science is. So I think the one way to create awareness is for, by us doing it ourselves, right? And also, you know, organizations need to be created around this. And I think awareness needs to happen at a very early stage before even, even um, universities, primary level, high school level, and even in universities. Um, and I think also even in the workplace, um, data science, is, it's that word, you know, when someone says data science, it's like, ooh, but it's, it's not highly understood. And I think awareness needs to be created around that as well. So I think it, it, to my answer, the only way we can address this is by us taking the initiative ourselves. As all the women in this room, we know what data science is. We know what AI is. We know what cloud computing is. And not a lot of school children know who are in primary right now. They know their conventional careers. They know what a doctor is. They know what a lawyer is. So let's take it upon ourselves to create that awareness. You know, whether you start an NGO back at home, whether you just go home and, you know, ask your teachers from back then to give you 30 minutes of your time, of their time to teach learners about what data science is, what science is, not even just data science, you know, what science is, even computer science. A lot of kids don't know what Python is. If you go to metric now and you say, do you guys know what Python is? They literally think you're talking about a snake. That was me, because I didn't know what it was. I found out about it 
in university, we need to create awareness around this and we need to take the initiatives to do that ourselves because, you know, sometimes depending on big groups and governments to do things, it delays things. So let's take it upon ourselves to create that awareness. Even in universities, whoever asked this question, now that you join this session and you know what it is, you could literally start your own group when you in, in university, you set up a stand and you put posters and you start talking about data science. You would be playing your part so that someone who comes after you knows more than you knew. So yeah, that's that's my point. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I see Kagonia, your hand is up. Please take the floor. Yes, I, I really like this question is because my field, HCI, is also another very confused field. I remember when I was in undergrad, I, I had a class, a HCI class, and I didn't even remember that I even took that class because the lecture would come in and literally give us stories about his week, his weekend, his shopping, his farm. Like there was nothing around human continuing interaction that I learned in that class. However, after my first degree, so guys were saying, you know, you're, you're, like, you're finding out about it in third year, fourth year, never panic. After my first degree, which was in business information technology, I came across human continuing interaction. Then I purposed to know more about it because I loved it. I realized this is exactly where I want to be designing systems. Um, you know, I love how it meshes with, you know, the humanities. I love how it meshes with now my technical background of computer science. So I said, I'm going to purpose. And so what I did, I did. I, I applied to university. I, I literally Googled the best university in the world to do HCI. Carnegie Mellon came up and that's how I applied. Now, this is, a, this is a, a time where you're getting more and more access to places or institutions. It doesn't have to be necessarily a university, but you can, you can do a course online. Um, I love that there are courses being added to the, to the chat, so that I'd really push for you guys to, to take initiative and to go for it. So when you do find out that, you're, that your university is not giving you a pure data science um, or, or you know, machine learning course, Take initiative yourself. There's no excuse. Not wait for the university to change or for the dean to come up and say that they've corrected everything. Now that you know, do something about it. Literally, your future is in your hands, right? And do like apply. If we, if you if you want to go to for a master's, apply. Apply to 20, 30, and get in. If you don't get into a master's, look for another course that you can do. Seek out the people here. I love that you guys are forming these coding groups. I can see in the chat. Reach out to the panelists. Ask which one can I do and do it. So you really have to take initiative. Another thing, so I now work at Microsoft. There are different types of um, roles, right? So there's the data analysts. I think someone here said they've done Power BI and data and analytics. Awesome. There's data scientists that we look for. There's machine learning engineers, and then there's AI engineers. Those are four different, and there are more. I'm only mentioning four for now, right? So find which one you want to be and start there. Guys who have a background in maths, in economics, you're perfect, right? When you top up that with some programming skills, you're perfect for this field. If you if you if, you're, if you really want to enter this field, don't worry too much about what you, what your undergrad is. What you need to worry about is your passion, because there'll come to a time and you'll be doing very complex work. It's not easy. And um, and as Patlaku said, even in industry, we see a lot of people who claim to be data scientists, but they're not. We see a lot of people who claim to be machine learning engineers, and they're not. So if you really want to be in this field, passion is the first thing you start with. Then do a lot of volunteer work volunteer to work um, at organizations that need a data scientist, need a machine learning engineer, and you can learn on the job. Do a lot of competitions. There's several competitions um, for, for uh, machine learning. So do a lot of those. And, and, and some of these competitions lead to money. So that's a very good motivator too. Um, I'll try and get the link for the, I'll, I'll post the link in the chat. So you can you know, partner with a few of the coding buddies you've just created, take part in a competition, make sure you you, you will brush your skills. And it's a global rotor. So you're complete, competing with people internationally, right? So my challenge, honestly, is it's up to you. Um, I'm someone who, if I want something, I'll go for it. So it's not about sitting down and saying, oh, excuse this, excuse that. Do you really want it? Then go for it. So I'll post some links here and you can take these global competitions are very good because they help you to kind of, grow, grow with time. And it doesn't matter your age. You can start at 16, start at 18, start at 35, start at 40. What's most important is your passion. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, very, very important input. Um, and I love the message of 
you know, if you see something, just apply. Um, I, I think it's fantastic that you just, you looked for the best, found Carnegie Mellon and just went for it. It's just, it's a fantastic thing to do. Um, I see, uh, so we, we just have a question that's come through YouTube and then Google it, so I'll come to you after this. This question is, please share uh, links to competitions and projects for women in data science and, and geoinformatics. Um, I, I, I think, so geoinformatics, this is slightly different. So if you could just post um, a couple of those links, that would be great. And then we could maybe copy them into the, into the YouTube chat. Um, Google it, your hand is up, please take it away. Uh, thanks, Carolina. So there are two questions that I, uh, I came across. One was in the chat and the other one I see is uh, from Felicia. The, uh, the one that was from the chat is, um, what are the key challenges of the 4IR in Africa? Which is something that uh, when I started my, uh, my uh, introduction earlier, it's something that I also alluded to. And with the one from Felicia, um, she says, unfortunately, few are aware of artificial intelligence or machine learning and associated with a threat of, to humans. How can we overcome this barrier and lack of information or knowledge on this topic? So I'm gonna try to just uh, fuse the two questions together, starting with the key challenges, of course. The first one, uh, as women, we know that the STEM field is a field that is uh, male dominated or it's, it's the stigma is that, oh, if you're a lady, you can go to nursing, teaching, all of those, but we were never encouraged to do engineering and, and, and in such a way that uh, I don't know what it is, but um, as girls grow older, their priorities kind of change. And funny enough, the boys in the class will become more technically inclined to pursue this, um, this uh, subject. So my suggestion is the first thing that we can do as women is to break that bias. Let's just break that bias, get rid of the fear to pursue the STEM field and actually just instill as mentors, as uh, you are being mentored by someone, as a mentor, it is our job to instill that tradition, to instill that kind of mentality to say, to say, you know what, you can actually do anything you want. And um, so the, 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 now coming to uh, Felicia's um, question, the challenge that I have seen in my work life is that yes, we've got girls who will graduate with the MSc in physics, in computer science, in, in, in all of those fields. But once you give them a project that involves coding, that involves software development or application development or web development, then they run away. And then you now realize that it's the fear, as much as this person has studied to this level, there's still that little thing that is holding them back. Now, that unfortunately is up to the individual as well to take charge of, you know what? I'm done with uh, uh, entertaining this fear. I'm done with entertaining this imposter syndrome. I have been here, I have achieved my MSc. It means I can do it. So you just dive in. The fear, just take it away. The stigma, take it away. Just break the bias. And then to come back to the key challenges of for industrial revolution. So the first one was that one of uh, the stigma around the STEM field being a male, in being a male field. The other one, which is what uh, Patrick was uh, talking to is the lack of infrastructure. If you think about it, I'm gonna talk about South Africa now, we are still stuck in the third one. A bit in the fourth uh, revolution, but we are still stuck in the third one, which is now the lack of supply for, in, for the whole of uh, the South African uh, hemisphere, number one. Without electricity, there's no water. Without water, we can't generate electricity, we cannot have internet. So there's still a lot of challenges. And I don't know whether it applies. I know it applies to most of uh, the, the, the African continents, uh, the countries in the African continents, but those are still our challenges. Now, as uh, Patlako has said, uh, it's something that we need to address. And uh, because it's a problem that affects all of us, whether we, we like it or not. So now how we overcome this uh, barrier of lack of information or knowledge, first of all, 
Don't only depend on the teacher. Do the work yourself. Get a mentor in the same field. Get friends in the same field. Study, read, understand, apply bit by bit, and then the barriers will be slowly but surely broken. Break the bias, ladies. Let's break the bias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our panelists for fantastically deep and thoughtful answers uh, to these great questions. Uh, and also thank you to the audience for your questions. Um, and I'm very glad that, uh, that we've been able to have such a, such a great conversation. Um, this is, so now for the last um, half an hour of this session, we're just going to go around all of our panelists as well for, um, for concluding words. Um, yeah, breaking the bias, love that. Um, and, uh, but I would just like uh, to just mention just four points that I, that I take from all the input, the incredible input that we've received, um, other than you know the incredible resources that have been shared, is that, well, firstly, there is a wealth of opportunities. And <clears throat> these opportunities are growing also in Africa and for Africans. So it's, it's, it's happening right here, and that's very important. So it's, it's key for, for young African women to grab these opportunities and make their mark. And because, because as women, we have, we have other perspectives where things to contribute. The second point is to feel confident to create those opportunities for oneself. Um, and, um, you know, like applying for programs that, that I don't know, <clears throat> maybe, there's, maybe we think there's not a big chance to be accepted. And then one day we are, <clears throat> excuse me. And also, um, if we're not accepted, it's not a judgment on who we are. We feel confident, we keep applying, we keep growing. Uh, but also seeking mentors and peers. And I, I, I think our, our panelists today really have shown what kind of mentors they are, you know, leading from the heart and, and leading by doing. I mean, thank you so much for, for this incredible leadership that we've seen today. And another message that I get from all of this is to dare to change the world, dare to be ambitious, and dare to go out there and make it happen. So for the, for the, for the last uh, round, I would like to, to go, go around the, the table again, and maybe um, we'll do it in, the other, in the, other, the other way around. Start. So we'll start with Potlako, if you, could, if, you, if you have a few concluding words to share with us. Um, I think for me, I'm just so inspired, to be honest. Um, everything that the ladies have spoken about is honestly, I literally feel like, the, um, you know, people who are listening, I, I'm just listening, I'm like, you know, wow. And I think the last thing I would want to say to everyone in this room, especially, you know, the young ladies who are probably going to be in the same path as me is um, honestly, and it's something that Google just said, and it's, I think it's so important. A lot of us tend to sit to wait for uh, events or things or initiatives to come to us for information. And in reality, Google literally just said it now. You have to take it upon yourself, right? You have to stand up and say, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to achieve. Go and find a mentorship yourself. Don't wait for a mentorship program to pop up from some way. Because sometimes by the time it pops up, it's too late. So if you're passionate about something, you want to learn something, my, my biggest advice to you is be a person, be a woman who believes in themselves enough to take initiative when it has to happen. And that's the best thing you can ever do for yourself. And uh, speaking to Giriboni asked me, how did I transition into data science? It's exactly that. I took the initiative to say, when I was doing my third year, I heard about this thing called data science. Now it was up to me to decide if I'm gonna do something about it or not, right? So take initiative. And if you ever find yourself in the workforce, another thing which is something that Kahonye mentioned is, every time people think about data science, they think, oh, I have a degree in this and that, and it's not data science, how do I make it there? You don't need a degree in data science to be a data scientist. So I just wanna say that. I didn't have a degree in data science. I studied astrophysics and applied mathematics. 
You don't need a degree in data scientist to become a data scientist. You need to want to become a data scientist to become a data scientist. It's that simple. Because the moment you have the passion and the willingness and the drive for something, then you will take the initiative. And that's how I did it. I made sure that once I get into the working force, I start finding out where are the data science teams, who are the data scientists, who are people in, in leadership who, are, who have influence in this space, and how do I make sure that I prove to them that I'm worthy? I prove to them that I'm passionate about this. And that's how you build the data science skill. And you also do self-learning, which is something Google touched on, you know, do certifications, do, you know, competitions, literally just take it upon yourself to, to, to teach yourself, to mentor yourself, to go out and to look for the resources that you need to make it. And otherwise, besides that, thank you so much to everybody. Thank you so much for this event. It's been mind blowing <laughs> to say the least. And I hope this is um, the first of many. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those words. Um, and Elda, do you have any um, thoughts that you would like to share? Thanks very much, um, Carolina. And thank you so much for all the panelists and the participants. I must say, just your questions has been thought inspiring and I wish I could spend more time with each of you to understand your individual needs, to see how we can address that. Um, I think the, the program that I spoke about, the escalator that is specifically looking at data science um, skills for humanities and social sciences scholars, um, is one step in a direction that there's a huge need, but we're not reaching everyone. Um, and that program is funded through the South African government. And obviously we'll be focusing on um, scholars at South African institutions, although it's very much about embedding um, South African scholars in the broader international research community and across sectors, not only research community, um, mm -hmm. government, um, NPOs, NGOs, um, and industry as well. Um, so through the questions that we've received and the other conversations from other panelists, I just realized there's still so much more to do to make data science accessible um, and to make sure that there are um, good opportunities to bring everyone on board. Uh, if you just think about, uh, as many of the panelists have been saying, data science is pervasive in our lives today, whether you want to apply for a home loan or if you're looking for insurance or want a payout for a medical claim, data science um, is there because the algorithms are making decisions about us, uh, about our livelihoods, about our families. Um, and we need to bring more people on board and we need to make sure that, that we upskill ourselves and not shy away from from data science concepts. We don't all have to be mathematicians. We don't all need degrees in data science, but we do need to be um, part of the conversation. And I, I really want to invite you, um, I've shared my, my email address there. Um, if you, uh, first of all, if you're in South Africa and you're not um, from STEM and you don't know how to get um, involved in data science or, or equip yourself looking for programming buddies or whatever, please reach out. If you're not from South Africa and you are from STEM or and or are from STEM, you're still welcome to reach out and I can still put you in touch with other people. But I think Carolina and the rest of the people also have very good relationships with people in bioinformatics um, and astronomy and other places. So there's definitely a place where we can connect you to. Um, and yeah, just thank you very much. And I really hope that people feel a bit more encouraged and a bit more welcome in the data science space. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for those wise words. Um, inclusion is key, right? Um, thank you so much. Um, okay, Kagonia, would you like to, to share with us your, your final thoughts on this conversation? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. So like other panelists, I've really enjoyed this panel. I've enjoyed the questions and the participation from the audience. Um, and thank you very much, Carolina, for moderating us. Um, so I think my last point really goes back to why we, we, why we should enter fields like, you know, um, machine learning, AI, data scientists, um, becoming data analysts. Um, it's because what we bring to the table, even just by being a woman, um, is, is that we understand how, what it feels to be othered, right? So we, we don't necessarily, you know, it's, it's, 
it becomes not surprising when you have people like Google who are the only ones in the department who are women, right? Or Potlaku, it becomes like, oh yeah, that's what's expected. So you you see this kind of like othering where it's the main, the mainstream and then women are others or, you know, other identities are others. So now that you understand what it means to be othered, you bring your knowledge and you bring your experiences to how you're going to, to, to code or you're going to build systems or you're going to create solutions for people. So um, I know like say what, how we learn, a lot of the learning we do is based on Descartes who says, I think, therefore I am. But there's another view of knowledge, which is called phenomenology, which is I am, therefore I am. Meaning based on not only what I know, what I read, based on my experiences, I learn. So there's a difference between, um, um, say, let's say like a man from the global north who can read about um, the, the, how women have struggled and have fought through histories. Then there's a difference between a woman who's fought those, through those histories there's a knowledge that she has that's different from his. So what I'm trying to encourage you as women is that you have these experiences that you've lived through. It can be nothing related to data science. It can simply be the fact that this morning I had to cook breakfast for like seven people. That's it, right? It can be the fact that you're the one who's gonna be relied upon to, to stitch dresses and clothes when they're torn. It can be the fact that you're the one who like today I have a role and I was like, why can't my mother give me give this role to my brothers? But I was like, ah, calm down, Kagonya. <laughs> You know, it's more like a role that probably feels like it's going to be given to a woman. So these experiences are magnificent, right? And they can be the bad experiences when we're talking about um, gender-based violence. We're talking about access to paths, as Potlaku is talking about. They're kind of like those bad experiences. There's something that's happening currently in Kenya that's created a whole furor because a lady was unfortunately attacked by um, what's called border border drivers, um, or motorcycle drivers. It, it's terrible. Now, these experiences that we have witnessed, that our friends go through, our families go through, we bring them into the solutions we make, right? So because you, you know what it feels like to be othered, yeah? When I studied out of my country as a Black woman, I know what it feels like to be othered. I bring, I turn this, make lemonade, and then I develop it into the systems I design so that no one else has to feel that othering. No other man, no other woman, no other white, Black, you know, person, whatever there is, no one has to be to feel that othering. So it's really, that's why you need to be in data science. That's why you need to be in machine learning. That's why we need you to create these algorithms and these solutions because you know what it feels like to be othered. So that's my final word to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for this very important point and, uh, and the value of, of experiences that have been historically terribly undervalued. So thank you for that. Um, Cherise, would you, would you like to share with us your, your thoughts um, on this conversation, please? Yes, please. Thank you, Carolina. And thank you so much to the organizers and the, these uh, remarkable panelists that have been here with me today and the audience. It's just, it's always so inspiring to hear other people's experiences and it really reinforces my strength to do what I can um, to bring about change. And I was thinking, you know, my vision for changing the status quo here really involves women who currently play a role in STEM, continuing as they've been doing today to be vulnerable, being open about challenges in their fields, raising their voices, being heard and connecting more with other women in STEM and allies who want to see a more inclusive society. And it's wonderful to see that really happening in the chat already. So taking initiatives, if, if you don't see something happening in your space or your institution, be brave, be the one to start it, find a mentor, be a mentor yourself. Um, it, you know, it, it, we are all just a network for each other there for support. Um, so for established women in STEM, it means being open to mentoring, finding the time for volunteering, um, to engage with young students, industry stakeholders, being that advocate. From an industry perspective, I want to see new positions being advertised, equitable hiring practices, and I think education and engagement, sharing our success stories to highlight what's possible for women in these fields. And I think women typically seek employment opportunities where they believe they will make an impact, right? And be connected to community advancement in a number of ways. And I want to show young women that roles in STEM fields like AI, like machine learning, like additive manufacturing directly fulfill those needs. And there is a need and a place for us in these spaces, in these industries, and together as women looking for and making our own opportunities for ourselves and those around us and for our fellow women, we can really see it become a reality. It's not easy, but we can do it. So just don't stop developing yourselves, ladies. Continue finding those passions, developing those skills, and go after what it is that you want. 
Thank you, Carolina. <laughs> Thank you, Cherise. Uh, that's, yeah, that's fantastic. And it's also great to have a, uh, the voice of an entrepreneur who's built a company from the ground up um, say, say this, these messages. I think it's very powerful. So thank you for that. Um, and um, Dr. Rabase, would you, would you like to grab the mic to give your final thoughts on this panel, please? Yes, I don't, I don't know how I can add to all the amazing insights we've, we've already had today. Um, uh, it's been great to hear from my fellow panelists and especially the fact that they covered most of the things that I would have said as well. So I was able to just be quiet and, and drink it all in and see all those amazing questions from our panelists as well. Um, but I think I'll leave with two main points. Um, as a social scientist and kind of being one who tends to focus on ringing the alarm bells and, and then trying to you know, make sure that we don't harm each other. Um, one is, you know, we, we cannot assume that uh, more women in technology, more women in data science is going to lead to different results than what we have right now. And so really, and this is a point that I think someone made earlier on, we have to commit to doing things differently um, if we want to have a real impact on the world, to change the world, to make the world a better place. And one of those, those ways I think is to um, help to introduce different ways different ways of being almost in the, in the technology industry, different models of leadership, different values, um, a different sense of what the, the ideal employer um, employee might look like. Um, these are all currently very masculine oriented, you know, profit focused, hard work, working um, extra hours, what we call uh, work devotion. Um, versus say family devotion. And oftentimes women and men are rewarded for both work devotion and family devotion. Um, women are usually you know, punished for, for family devotion in the workplace and punished for work devotion in the family. So you know, women can't win in you. We have to try and change that dynamic, that double standard and women, you know, have more women showing that there are different ways to lead. You don't have to be, you don't have to behave like a man in order to be successful in the technology industry. And oftentimes that's what women have to do to succeed. So how do we change that? Um, and one of the ways is actually to include men in these conversations when we're talking about change. So I think that's something to, to have on our minds for the bigger uh, picture. But the other thing is, to think about as you, you know, um, progress in your, your careers, think about the potential unintended impacts of your work. So when digital technologies, mobile phones, you know, uh, um, exploded and for example, we had um, more fisher folk having access to information on where to fish, right? This was a good thing, considered a good thing because that information was enabling them to enhance their incomes. But what did that lead to ultimately overfishing? This is an unintended impact that was not really thought about. And we are seeing some of these issues emerge with the new technologies. And some of them, um, you, 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 you can't know until it's already happened. But oftentimes there are things that could, be, could have been anticipated if there were more women involved, maybe, um, or if there were just a, a greater diversity of voices participating in the creation process. So I would really urge all the, the young data scientists who are, are with us today that as you progress with your work, keep thinking about and, and, and being conscious of and sensitive to the potential negative impacts of your work. That will help reduce the fears that people have about uh, AI, for example, as a threat to, to humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for raising those very, very um, important points. Um, and uh, yeah, so 
potential unintended consequences is something we haven't really had an opportunity to talk about a lot. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to invite Kuguletu to share your final thoughts on this panel. Uh, thank you, Carolina. My final thoughts, I'm going to ride on the panelists' wave. The first wave being uh, Kagonya's wave, where she said, I think, therefore I am. What we need to remember as well on that same note is that thoughts become things and things become habits. So if you can just in your 24 hour day, give yourself 30 minutes, either when you wake up or before you sleep, just to do some reading. What is artificial intelligence? Then you will see how that is the parent of machine learning and how machine learning is the parent of deep learning. And then you just see what are the various methods that make each and every one of them unique in their own right. The other wave that I would like to write upon is the one by Dr. Araba. We also need to remember that it all starts with you. As a woman, when you walk into a space filled with men, and there's only one or two of you. Occupy your space. Be comfortable with yourself. Let your presence be felt. Learn to listen so that you can talk or respond when needed. Don't just jump every time there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a nerve that's being hit. Lastly, I'm going to use the, the words of Dolores Cannon, who always tells us you are the producer, you are the director, and you are the actor of your own play, right? In that, you are also the writer of your own script. So that script is being written as you live your life from each and every moment, not even day, each and every second, that script is being written. Remembering that if you are the writer of your own script, then if you don't like how the scene is going, change the script. Make it to what you want it to be. Does not matter the situation. Don't drown when you feel pressured. Stay afloat. And that is how much power we have. Unfortunately, we just don't realize it. So ladies, own your space. Doesn't matter who you're with, where you are, what you're doing, what you're reading, just open up, let yourself be empty so that you can absorb and understand and gain the insight as much as you can. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you so, so much. Um, I, I really, I would like, so if we could just do one thing quickly, if, we, if all the panelists could please put on your cameras so that we can take a, at least a screen grab of our incredible panel here. Okay, wonderful. And you know what, I'll switch off my video quickly so we only have our distinguished speakers as well. Fantastic, thank you so, so much. Um, this has truly been incredibly inspiring. Um, and I really thank all of you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time uh, because ironically, International Women's Day is one of the busiest day for women around the world because there are so many events. And I think, you know, all of this visibility and these conversations need to be spread over the whole year. Um, and um, and, and so, so thank you for taking the time to share your insights. And to, to the audience who, who came and listened and, and seized the opportunity that we've got by having these incredible women here. Um, and, and I would like just maybe just one last little thing that I would like to, to tell the audience is also to, to be kind to yourselves because this incredible uh, panel that we have here today, these women who have phenomenal achievements, who have created things, have had an impact on the world, created employment, changed people's lives, mentored young people. Um, I can guarantee you that none of them and none of us are where we are today without stumbling along the way. And 
so if if there are challenges and if there are roadblocks and you stumble on the way and you if you fall it's okay um, and it doesn't ever write off your future um, success um, and so so really thank you so much to the panelists thank you to the audience um, I just want to see if this we have one more minute I see this yeah there's more um, thank yous coming in the chat and in the q and A. I I think everyone is, is really on a high. Thank you so much for, for setting this beautiful spirit for this event today and, and for sharing of yourselves uh, with us today. Um, and, and with that, maybe we can, we can all sort of clap virtually because I think if we were, if we were in a room, you would be getting an absolute standing ovation. Um, Potlako, did I see you raise your hand or? I'm sorry, I wanted to clap, but I clicked raise hand by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that counts. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. We also are perfectly on time. So um, in the program for the event today, we have lunch break now, so I would like to to hand over to Bonita and maybe Lindsay to see if there are any um, sort of maintenance, um, sort of housekeeping uh, announcement. Um, and so with this, my thanks to the panelists and, uh, and have a wonderful, wonderful International Women's Day and 365 days after that until we see you next year. You too, Thank everyone. Thank Bye. you. Same to you, Carolina and everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carolina, and thank you to the panel. That was truly an inspiring conversation. And I hope that these conversations can continue, not just today, but you know, throughout the year. Um, there is just one announcement. We will be breaking for lunch now, and we'll be back at quarter to two South African time. Um, for those individuals that are joining via the YouTube streaming, um, I just want to ask you to keep a lookout. There will be two different links for the two sessions today. And uh, those links will be posted on the Dara Big Data Twitter page. Um, so just to notify you that the links will be different. Um, and also we might just have to cut um, one of the sessions um, uh, just because um, not all the speakers we don't have all the permissions from all the speakers to be able to present their talks today. But um, I think this afternoon, again, we have a number of different speakers or ladies that will be showcasing their careers. And I look forward to, to the afternoon that we will be seeing this um, afternoon. And with that, we're going to break for lunch. Thank you very much for everyone for joining the session today and um, continue to post your questions in the chat.